Greetings citizens. Hey you, hey you beautiful creepy human being you. Welcome to my channel and welcome to today's true crime video. I'm so happy we could meet like this. I'm so happy that somehow in all of this that we're forced to deal with on the day today, today you and I were able to find each other on this crazy little planet that we call home. My name is Brittany or Bratterstein, whichever you prefer. And today we're going to be having a true crime marathon. But before we get started, if you have not yet had the pleasure Please make sure to join the Brat Pack by subscribing and ringing the bell. I put out a new video every single week, sometimes two a week like this week, and I would love to hang out with you. Yes, you specifically you, but I can only do that if you join the Brat Pack and become one of us. Now, before we get into this video, I first need to say a big thank you to the sponsor of today's video, and that is Huge Casino. So I want to start this off with a question for you, and the question is this. Do you love Las Vegas, but like in a vacuum? Like you love the idea of Las Vegas, but you don't love the idea of, you know, losing real money or having to leave your house because I know that those things are very true to me and if they are true to you too or even if they're not true to you I'd like to introduce you to Huge Casino. Huge Casino is a free to download online slot game that gives you all the fun of Las Vegas with hundreds of different games that you can play from retro to modern slot machines that are inspired by real slot machines to poker, blackjack, which blackjack and slots are something that I personally do. Poker is something that I haven't mastered yet but I know a lot of people love poker. And with Huge Casino, players who love poker can play poker along with roulette, baccarat, and blackjack on top of all the slots. And this app offers all of this but without the risk of losing any real money because there is no real money involved. You're not playing for real money prizes or spending any of your actual money. So it's a very low stakes form of entertainment, which is personally what I'm into. Low stakes and free, count your girl in. And speaking of which, it's not only free to play, but it's also free to download. You can get it on Android or iOS. I personally have it on my iPhone. And fun fact, you can make groups and do little sessions with your friends. You guys can join a club and compete in the Billionaire League. Now, I personally have been playing this one here. This one is called Huge Diamonds because, you know, diamonds are a girl's best friend. No, they're not. But I do actually have, I don't know if I can show you. I don't know if it'll show. I have a diamond tattoo on my arm, but I'll show you a close up of the game in just a second. But I like this one in particular, and I have been enjoying my time playing this one because it is very um, straight and to the point in its design, which is something that I've been kind of into lately. I'm into a more low key, uh, a more low key way of living life. You know what I mean? Like a minimalist queen. Now here's the close up. The graphics are very similar to the classic slots that you may be used to. And as you can see, I have been winning big and also getting these like mini side games that have been supplementing my winnings. So I don't have to stop until I want to because how much do you hate to be playing a game? And then it's like, well, now you have to wait for tomorrow for, you know, the time to go by before you get more coins, ETC, ETC. I'm not a big fan of that. I'm an adult and I can choose when I stop. And the supplemental income that I get from these side quests just kind of, you know, help me do that. Anyways, I like playing this game because I am one of those people who likes Vegas in a vacuum. I have been there several times. I live close enough that it is within driving distance, so it takes forever to get there. And you know, when I'm there, I do slick, slick to slots, stick to slots. I've always wanted to play that black jack, but I'm not willing to bet the minimum on the table. I just have to be honest with you. And even just playing the slots when I do the pennies, I lose a considerable amount of real money quickly. And that's just not something I'm interested in. And I'm also at this point in my life, not really interested in making that drive, especially the drive back if you're coming home on like a Sunday. No, thank you. So Huge Casino has been a welcomed wind down activity for me at the end of the day when I'm just laying on the couch, enjoying my low stakes free fun. So if you'd like to experience all the thrills of Las Vegas without any of the downside, like, I don't know, traveling there, crowded casinos, or leaving your house, please make sure to download the app through the link in my description box by using the link in my description box. It lets them know that I'm the one that sent you, which helps, you know, helps my channel. So please make sure to download through my link. And if you do, by the way, come back and let me know what your favorite slot is. And if you download through my link, you get a welcome gift, a welcome gift of five million free chips so you can start playing and having your nice carefree fun today. Now I just want to say a big thank you to Huge Casino for partnering with me on today's video. It's partners like Huge Casino that make it possible for me to put out videos as consistently as I do. And a big thank you to you guys for always being so supportive of all my sponsors. You rock, don't ever change. All right, today's video, like a couple other before it, you know, in the weeks I've put out compilations here and there, but that's what this video is. I kind of felt the feelers. I felt those feelers. 
I put it out there to kind of see what you guys were thinking and it turns out a lot of you like me have an issue with silence and put on a long video or a podcast to be sort of the soundtrack of your life because that's something that I do. I have something playing all day long and I know some of you do as well. And I know some of you for whatever reason I am your choice in YouTubers and so I wanted to have something long that you could put on have on throughout the day for you to listen on in the background of your life or say you're going out to the store and your dog needs something to listen to just a long form video for those who want it so if I just described you this video is for you with all of that said come gather around and let me tell you the story of the murder of one of the most famous and most influential musicians of all time John Lennon on December 8, 1980, 25-year-old Mark David Chapman, who had just traveled from Hawaii to New York, finally arrived at his destination. And this was the Dakota. And the Dakota was the apartment building where John Lennon lived with his wife, Yoko, and his young son, Sean. Sometime a little after 11 p.m., John Lennon and his wife, Yoko, arrived back home after a very long day, which we'll get into a little bit later, of all the things that they did. Very long day. And when they got there, they walked right past Mark David Chapman with John Lennon and his murderer making eye contact as they walked in their building. That is when Mark David Chapman realized that now was the time. He said in his head over and over, do it, do it, do it. And that's when he reached in his pocket and he pulled out a 38 caliber Charter Arms pistol. He aimed it at John Lennon's back and he fired five bullets, four of which hit him in the back. The gunman then, instead of trying to run, trying to flee, trying to get away from the scene of his murder, uh, instead sat down and pulled out a book, which was a copper, a copper, a copy of the book, A Catcher in the Rye, and sat down and just began reading it. And when police arrived and took this book into custody, they found that inside the book, there was a message written by Mark David Chapman, and it said, to Holden Caulfield from Holden, Holden Caulfield. This is my statement. And he also went on to tell police that anyone who understood literature and had read this book would understand why he had done what he had done. He romanticized his murder, saying of the shooting, and I quote, Something very extraordinary has happened with an extraordinary book, and without ego, an extraordinary person, and Lenin, an extraordinary person, and the Beatles, an extraordinary cultural movement in the 60s and early 70s, probably the culture experience, musically and culturally. They changed the world as we know it, and I changed them. So I want to start the whole story by telling you about John Lennon and who he was. And it's not like he really needs an introduction. I mean, John Lennon and the Beatles were a massive revolution in modern music at the time. But in researching him and his life, I found a ton of really interesting information that I think you guys would be very interested to hear, because I know you guys like the deep dives and a lot of backstory, and I also enjoy that. And then we're going to get into Mark David Chapman, who he was and how he, you know, went and made his decision to commit his crime. And then of course the actual crime itself, we're going to talk about everything that happened that day. So let's do it. John Lennon was born October 9th, 1940, and he was born to his mother, Julia, and his father, Alfred. John Lennon's father, Alfred Lennon, married his mother, Julia Stanley, when they were quite young. The two had met as teenagers, and they were both casual musicians, which is probably where John ended up getting his musical bone. The Independent noted that Julia's family was less enthusiastic about the two getting together. They felt that Alfred was, like, a little below her, maybe not a good, not a suitable match for their Julia. But despite that, Alfred and Julia were married in 1938 in secret and without any family there. They were like, fuck you guys, we're going to elope then. Love conquers all. All you need is love. Julia's family was pretty pissed off that the two had gone and done this, but they had to just kind of accept it because, I mean, they're married at this point. There's not much you're going to do. What are you going to do? Get divorced in, like, the 30s? Absolutely fucking not. Nobody was doing that. So that would have been a lot worse for them. And I'm sure his family and her family would have been a lot more upset to see that happen. But either way, the marriage didn't end up lasting long anyway because World War II broke out. Or was it World War I? World War II broke out. And Alfred ended up having to leave. He was a merchant seaman. So he took off and he was gone a lot of the time. But fortunately, before he left, him and Julia consummated that marriage. And she became pregnant with the two's one and only child, a son named John Winston Lennon. John's father, Alfred, was an absent father. And he was raised primarily by his mother, at least for the first couple years. There was a change in 
child ownership a bit later, which we're going to get into. Um, but Julia raised him alone in the beginning because Alfred essentially dipped. He didn't want much to do with his son, not just because of the war and his job, but he just wasn't really into it. He wasn't even there when John was born and he did not attempt to make contact with John Lennon after he was five years old until many years later when John was an adult and famous as fuck for being in the Beatles. John Lennon said of his father, and I quote, I never knew my father. I saw him twice in my life till I was 22 when he turned up after I'd had a few hit records. I saw him and I spoke to him and decided I still didn't want to know him. So I actually have a fun fact for you, which I completely forgot about, but um, okay, so in 1965, this is a fun fact about John Lennon's father, by the way. In 1965, John Lennon's dad was working at a bar, and this man, a music producer of some sort named Tony Cartwright, actually discovered him while he was in a pub. And so he attempted to make John Lennon's father a musician, calling him Fred Lennon, and trying to kind of like profit off the Lennon name because John Lennon was so famous, and tried to make him a musician. And I guess he did release a record, which I did not hear any of it. I just read this and I thought this was so interesting. But John Lennon heard it and like heard that this was happening and he was pissed. He was not about it. Supposedly, John Lennon was like, this is absolutely not going to happen. And he talked to his manager and was like, you need to do whatever it is that you have to do to make sure that this stops here. Nip this in the bud. And it's not said if his manager did something. But... Fred Lennon's career was quickly over after trying to release that one album and that album never did well at all. And I just thought that was so interesting because I had no idea. Did you know about that? Is there any, is there any, are there any Fred Lennon fans out there? Let a girl know. And I'm a girl. Let me know. Thank you. So we're going to go back to John Lennon's early days now. Uh, Julia, once her husband left, it was clear to Julia's family, at least at that time, they thought it was clear that Julia was not cut out to be a mom. Her husband was away at sea doing merchant seaman stuff. And she was still going out and partying. She was still going out and meeting guys. And there was even a rumor that she got pregnant by some passing like navalist, like somebody who was just passing through got her pregnant and that she ended up giving this baby girl up for adoption. It was real messy. There was a lot going on. And her family was like, okay, you are not fit to be raising this little boy right now. You are clearly going through something and we need to intervene. Apparently the last straw for her family came when Julia moved in with another man and they were pissed. Her family was super pissed off because technically speaking, though her and Alfred had separated, she was still married to Alfred because they never legally divorced. I don't know how this is any of her family's business, but whatever. They thought that that was just ridiculous. And her sister, a woman who went by Mimi, uh, was super pissed off about it and even uh, supposedly reportedly contacted child services to report her as being an unfit mother and told them like, this woman's crazy. This woman should not be caring for children. I should be her guardian, her guardian. I should be taking care of the child. And because of all the pressure that she was under, Julia reluctantly agreed to give her sister and her sister's husband custody of John Lennon, the baby, the, the child at around five years old. Isn't that fucked up? I don't know, man. That's how would you be friends with your sister ever? I mean, maybe Julia was in a worse, worse spot than we know, but it just sounds like it was of the times. And like, that sounds very normal now. So I don't know. So John ended up being raised and spent all of his formative years with his aunt and his uncle, his uncle George Too Good Smith was a dairy farmer and his aunt Mary went by Mimi. And I don't think she had a job, but I'm not hundred percent sure. I didn't see anything. And George, his uncle, was said to be a really good role model for him. J John saw him as like a father figure. They, the two were very close. And he even got John Lennon his first musical instrument, which was a mouth organ, which I don't know what that is. Please let me know. I don't have a musical bone in my body. And the two were just super close and they bonded over that. They bonded over a lot of things. But sadly, his uncle George ended up dying in 1955 of, I believe it was a liver hemorrhage, which is super fucked up must've been hard for John, especially since that was like his father figure, you know, but prior to that, both George and Mimi were seen as being good guardians, good role models, though it was Mimi who said to a young John Lennon after seeing of his immense fondness of music and particularly the guitar, she said to him, and I quote, the guitar's all very well, John, but you'll never make a living out of it. And boy, was she wrong. 
don't discourage your children. You could be raised in a John Lennon. You never know. So though John Lennon did not grow up with his mother, Julia, that she was not an absent mother by any means. And she still saw him all the time. She was over at his house with her sister all the time. They spent a ton of time together. They bonded over their love of music. Remember I said that she was a little bit of a musician herself and she actually bought him his very first guitar which he loved and they would just spend time together. She taught him a lot of different musics like the banjo and the piano and they would listen to records together. They just really bonded over their shared love of music. And you know, what's really, really freaking sad dude is when John was a teenager, I think he was only 16 years old. His mother, Julia was crossing a street and she got hit by a car and was killed when he was just 16 years old and it affected him immensely. As I'm sure you can imagine, that's a really hard age to lose a parent. That's just losing a parent in general is hard, but it affected him greatly. And shortly after this, things started going downhill for him. He started messing up in school. He started getting bad grades. He started going into to, to detention because he kept getting in fights. Like he was just straight up not having a good time after that. John Lennon as a teenager was just known as being just kind of a dick dude. He was mean. He was nasty to people. He was quote unquote, emotionally hardened. He was known for shoplifting and bullying other students and his teachers. Like he was just kind of an asshole when he was a teenager, but to be fair, he had, you know, just lost his mother and sometimes kids do act out. Um, but despite being a punk and a bully and a little bit of a pain in the ass, he was very good at art in school. He would draw all these little pictures and the headmaster of his school thought that he was good enough at his art to actually get into an art school, even though he had a lot of other issues, he was still very good at art and that was recognized in his school. So even though John Lennon was not having a good time at school, he was kind of being a little shit, just things weren't going too well. He was having a lot of fun outside of school. And that's because he had formed a little band of young men that were called the quarry boys. And this is the band that would eventually through lots of, you know, replacements of members would be morphed into the Beatles that we know and love today. Apparently John Lennon was inspired to start his band because of Elvis Presley. Apparently when Elvis came on the scene, you know, we all know everyone was obsessed with Elvis. People are still obsessed with Elvis. And John Lennon was one of those kids. He saw him and he thought he was amazing and wanted to form his band because of his love for music and seeing somebody else who inspired him to do so. And it's actually really cool because I heard through the grapevine that John Lennon did actually get to meet Elvis later in life. There was an interview online with, uh, with Paul McCartney. And Paul McCartney said that the Beatles all got to meet Elvis, which was like a humongous thing for them that the four of them piled in a car together and they drove over to Elvis's house. They knocked on the door and Elvis answered the door and they were just like, Oh my fucking God, it's Elvis. And said that he was super cool and he was super nice. And that the whole experience was very like there we've made it moment. And that they thought he was so cool because he was one of the first people to have a remote for his TV. They didn't have to like walk over and change the channels. He could just point and click. And they thought he was like a wizard a musical wizard and a remote control wizard. Anyways, moving on. On July 6th, 1957, the Quarrymen, the John Lennon's little band played a show, you know, just a local show they were playing. They were hanging out. They were having a good time. And it was at the show that a young John Lennon met another teenage boy who would end up being a big part of his life. And this teenage boy's name was Paul McCartney. Paul and John met, hit it off, had a lot in common, really vibed with each other. And they started hanging out. And within no time, Paul McCartney had joined the quarry men. And once he was in the band, he was like, Oh my God, John, you have to meet my other friend. I think you two will vibe heavy. And this was a man, a boy, they're teenagers named George Harrison. So while all of that's happening, he's doing the music thing. His band is playing shows. They're vibing together. They're having a good time. He's also in school and he ends up graduating from school. And despite having trouble in school and not having the best grades, he did manage to get himself into art school with a little help from his friends. <laughs> and in 1957, John began attending the Liverpool College of Art and John didn't do great there either. It really just seems that academics were not John Lennon's strong, strong point, you know, like that just wasn't what he was good at. But one good thing did come out of him attending this college. And that's that he met a girl that would one day be his wife. And her name was Cynthia Powell. Now, John, Mr. Lennon was not a good partner to Cynthia at all. And this isn't a secret. This is something that he has openly discussed in a lot of interviews and has, has admitted to doing. He 
has said that he was not a nice man to her and that he was physically and emotionally abusive to his first wife, Cynthia Powell. John Lennon said of his treatment of his first wife, Cynthia Powell, and I quote, I used to be cruel to my woman and physically any woman. I was a hitter. I couldn't express myself and I hit. I fought men and I hit women. That is why I'm always on about peace, you see. It's the most violent people who go for peace and love. Despite this, the relationship did continue, and shortly thereafter, Cynthia became pregnant with the couple's one child, John's first son, a boy who would be born on April 8th, 1963, and given the name Julian Lennon, after John's mother, Julia. In response to Cynthia's pregnancy, the two did decide to get married. They had a wedding, but on the night of their wedding, on their wedding night, John Lennon went out and played a show, went with his band. He went and played a show with the Quarrymen. And, I mean, he did go out and have dinner with his new wife first, but still, I just gotta say, that would not fly with me. (laughs) I would never uh, allow it, but that's just me. Neither Cynthia nor Julian had a good relationship with John Lennon. He was not known as being a good husband or a good father in his first round at life, I guess you could say. And John ended up leaving his first wife and child when his son Julian was only three years old. And Julian Lennon has said of his late father, and I quote, he wasn't a great father. He was a great musician. He added, dad was a hypocrite. He could talk about peace and love to the world, but could never show it to his wife and son. And another quote, I had a great deal of anger towards dad because of his negligence and his attitude to peace and love. The peace and love never made it home to me. So, ouch, but despite this, this um, path that he had did not affect his prominence at all. John Lennon's legacy has not been tarnished, and if anything, he's even more famous and more prominent now than he was when he was alive. Like, it, he, he was, imagine, I just think about how freaking cancel culture is now, and if that shit would have flown now, and I'm guessing probably not, but he just had... I don't know. I don't even know what to say. It's fucked up. Anyways, so John did his art school, left his family, he's doing his thing. And it was around the 19, the year 1960 that the Beatles became the Beatles. And this is after going through several name changes, such as the Beatles, but spelled B-E-A-T-A-L-S, the Silver Beatles, and then eventually just becoming the Beatles. They did a few tours, but never anything too big. That was until late 1961, when the group was playing at a club they frequented, a club called the Cavern Club. And it was there that they met a local record store owner and a music columnist named Brian Epstein. Immediately, Brian was into what he heard. He thought they had the it factor and quickly signed on as the group's manager. From there, things really changed for the Beatles in the next few years. In February of 1964, the now fully formed band of the four members that we know and love John, Paul, Ringo, and George came to America, landing in New York. They became the first British band to break out big in the United States, and they just had a greeting. There were so many people. There were so many teenagers awaiting their arrival. There were people everywhere, crowded everywhere. There were crowds everywhere. Tan everywhere. Jan everywhere. Have you heard of a little thing called Beatlemania. Two days after arriving in America, the Beatles made their first appearance on the Ed Sullivan Show. And this is a video you can find on YouTube. I've seen it several times. And the audience is just packed. They played a couple songs, and each of the men were introduced to the audience, them making sure to let the girls know that John was unavailable. Sorry, ladies. He is taken. So though he did bail on them, he was still technically married and they weren't going to get in any scandals by him like being seen as a single man. That same year, the band released the album A Hard Day's Night along with a movie of the same name and prepared for their first world tour. And that year, John Lennon actually ended up writing a book, his uh, a book him, himself. He just released it himself and it was called In His Own Right. Then in June of 1965, Queen Elizabeth II announced that the Beatles would be named a member of the Order of the British Empire. Then, in August, the boys performed for five, no, 55,600 fans 
at the New York Shea Stadium, setting a new record for the largest concert audience in musical history. With the rising popularity of the Beatles, so came the rise in publicity, and with that, public scrutiny. And John Lennon, who was a very controversial, artistic, and vocal man, would get himself and the Beatles, by extension, into a little bit of trouble because he just said whatever he thought, saying things like the fact that the Beatles were more popular than Jesus, which people did not enjoy hearing. And the controversies with him just continued when John Lennon, the still technically married Beatle, started um, being seen spending a lot of time with a local artist named Yoko Ono. John Lennon and Yoko Ono met at one of her art shows, and Yoko Ono actually says that she didn't know who John Lennon was. She had only heard of Ringo, she thought, because that name stood out to her, but she wasn't really big into that genre of music, so she says she didn't even know who John was. And that's what John Lennon told the Rolling Stones in 1971. He, like, did an article or an interview, and he told them that, like, she didn't even know who I was, but I don't know. I don't know if I believe that, but who knows? When the two met, they were both shy, and she later approached him because she needed some financial backing for one of her art shows, and at that time, she gave him a copy of her book called Grapefruit, and in reading that book, he has quoted as being said that he began falling in love with her. He ended up asking Yoko to come over to his place while his wife was away, and he played records for her. The two ended up collaborating, I believe, that evening on an album um, that was called The Two Versions. The Two Versions? No, The Two Virgins. And they actually finished that track as the sun broke out. And at that point, they made love. They made the love. Ugh, they made the love. In describing that night, John Lennon said, it was very beautiful. But as beautiful as it was, apparently Cynthia had come home to find her husband, John Lennon, and this woman, Yoko Ono, together wearing only robes. And as I'm sure you can imagine, a, a fight ensued. Uh, and shortly thereafter, John and Cynthia finally officially divorced, and John and Yoko Ono's relationship went from there. Both John Lennon and Yoko Ono have said that there was an immediate connection for both of them, and that their friendship slash relationship grew incredibly quickly. They loved each other super hard, and it was a very intense relationship. The two ended up even getting pregnant pretty early on after getting together, but sadly, Yoko ended up having a miscarriage, and this was really hard on the couple. Apparently, according to John, it was the loss of this child that pushed them both into using heroin, and they both got pretty heavily into heroin, and he said this was their way of just dealing with the pain of losing that baby. The year after John and Cynthia divorced, John and Yoko actually got married at the Rock of Gibral Gibraltar, in Europe. And the, the wedding ceremony was really small and intimate, but they decided to make their honeymoon more publicized, which is a choice. And what they ended up doing is they invited a bunch of reporters to come with them into their honeymoon hotel room, which was at the Amsterdam Hotel. And what John and Yoko did is they decided that they were going to stay in bed for an entire week to protest the war and promote uh, peace and love and chillin', not killing vibes. They did the same thing two weeks later in Montreal, and this is where the two famously sang the song, Give Peace a Chance, and also where John and Yoko said that they were going to, and I quote, stay in bed and grow your hair, which is incidentally a quote that I had on all of my social media bios for about 100 years. The year that John Lennon and Yoko Ono got married in September of 1969, John ended up actually leaving the Beatles. And there are many, many, many rumors that it was Yoko who pushed him to leave the Beatles, that she did maybe like a, it's either me or the Beatles type situation. But Yoko says that that's not the case. She says in her words that it was a natural growing out process. And there are also rumors that John's heroin use ended up being a big contributing factor to him leaving the group because as his addiction got worse and worse, his behavior got more erratic, his outbursts got more aggressive, more frequent and harder to manage. And that they just kind of were like, it's time for this to no longer be happening. But Yoko has said that this was already something that was happening, that all of the men independently were starting to feel that they wanted to do other things. They felt that it had run its course. They wanted to be pulled in other directions and do more solo work. 
Um, and John just happened to be the first one to do so because now he had a reason to want to, to go, you know what I mean? Which sometimes can be the case. Um, and regardless of that, shortly after John left the band um, in April of 1970, Paul McCartney also left the band and the Beatles were officially done. Sad day. Sad day, man. I wasn't there, but I can only imagine it would be a sad day. So after the Beatles, John started his solo career and he and Yoko decided to make a permanent home in the United States, settling at the Dakota apartment building in New York, where he would eventually die. And it was while living there that he recorded and released the song, Imagine. You know the song. We all know the song, Imagine. And it was this song, actually, along with his political activism, because he was very vocal and would go and do protests and speeches against the war. It was this song combined with that activism that actually made a lot of people, including the government, think that he was essentially a communist. And in response to that, they <laughs> revoked his visa, like straight up. They were like, you can't live here anymore. Like, you got to go, guy. John was told that it was due to his 1968 marijuana conviction, but he believed that it was due to his activism against the Vietnam War. So in response, he stopped protesting as much so that he wouldn't be on the government's radar but there were still threats of deportation, and he ended up having to bring the law into it, which is so weird to me. But he did end up getting his green card in the, the late 70s once Nixon was out of office. Which is just like, how? It just seems so freaking odd to me. That whole situation, I was like, like, I know there was, what is it, the red scare, the red panic, like there was a whole thing. But I was just like, damn, that's crazy to me. So... John and Yoko had a very intense relationship, as I said, and sometime in the 70s, John and Yoko actually ended up breaking up and they separated for a year. John wanted out of the relationship. He wanted something new. He wanted to spread his little wings and fly away. And Yoko was surprisingly in agreement for this. She was like, I need a break. I would like you to go. And it's not sure if it was a break from John himself or if it was a break from the bright lights and media that followed him everywhere. Cause that would be exhausting for somebody if they didn't, if they weren't used to that life. But either way they did separate for a year. John ended up leaving and he moved to California where he ended up, I believe living with a woman named May who he had a short relationship with. This was the uh, affair that she was, um, that Yoko was all for. And he refers to this time as his lost weekend because he, well, I mean, he lost all that time with, the woman that he loved so much, but also he was not the best version of himself there. He started heavily abusing alcohol again, heavily abusing drugs again, and apparently was physically abusive with just people in general and his partner, May. Yoko has said of John's lost weekend, and I quote, the affair was not something that was hurtful to me. I needed a rest. I was prepared to lose him, but it was better he came back. John and Yoko did end up rekindling their relationship, obviously. Um, it just seemed that what they needed was some distance apart to realize that they really loved each other and needed to be together. And that's what they were able to establish from that, that year apart. And shortly after he came back and they rekindled their relationship, Yoko ended up falling pregnant and she gave birth to the couple's first and only son, John's second son, on October 9th, 1975. And this was a little boy that they named Sean Lennon. It was after the birth of his son that he decided, John Lennon decided that he wanted to make a conscious effort to be the best husband and best father he possibly could. And to do that, he actually stepped away from the music and the headlines and the spotlight for years because he just thought that this is what his family needed. Um, he was at this point, a very successful solo artist, but he found that it just wasn't doing it for him anymore. He felt like a money machine and he wasn't really loving the process of making music anymore. At each day it was less loved and less loved because it was just like doing what you have to do to make money. And he decided that he just wanted to step back and step away from it and see what he wanted to do with his life. And plus he had just had a big scare where he almost lost his wife. He had left and things were just getting out of hand. So he decided to take a step back and leave the spotlight to just be a family man. By the end of the decade, John Lennon was living a different life. The once very open and opinionated and available musician had traded that in for a quiet life, just trying to be as normal as, I mean, a freaking John Lennon could be. I mean, how can, I don't know how you can go from being John Lennon to just a stay-at-home dad, but he did it. 
And he was gone for years without releasing music or doing interviews. And he was just living a calm life at home with his wife, Yoko, and his son, Sean. And during this time, he actually ended up reuniting with his son, Julian, as well. It seems like he was really trying to, like, make a better life for himself and be a better person. So after five years completely off the map, John Lennon, in 1980, reemerged. He decided that he wanted to start the new decade off making music again, you know, a tiger can't change his spots and he ended up coming back in with a big bang. John Lennon ended up releasing what was known to be a musical love letter to his wife and his son in an album called Double Fantasy. And within two months after its release, in December of that year, John Lennon would be murdered by Mark David Chapman. Now, who was Mark David Chapman? Mark David Chapman was born May 10th, 1955 in Texas, but was raised in a small suburb in Atlanta, Georgia. He was born to parents David, who was a staff sergeant in the U.S. Air Force, and his mother Diane, who was a nurse. And seven years after he was born, his family welcomed his young sister Susan into the world. His mother has claimed that she noticed nothing odd about her son growing up. He seemed totally normal. But Mark has said that he had an unhappy childhood. Mark has stated that as a boy, he lived in fear of his father, who he said was physically abusive towards his mother and unloving towards him. Mark began to fantasize about having king-like power over a group of imaginary people called the little people who lived in the walls of his bedroom. Real casually. Like little people do, you know? I don't know. Mark was a normal kid who did well in school. Um, things were really good for him. He did start to change a little bit in his teenage years and get a little bit more rebellious, a little bit more go into the dark side a little bit. But his mother kind of chalked this up to just the changing times and it being the 60s. Because during the 60s, man, there was just so much going on. Conservative views were taking a backseat to progression and revolution. And there was like a war. There was just a lot going on. I mean, the Beatles came to America in the 60s. Can you even imagine what the fuck everything was like? There was just so much going on. So she just chalked his changing attitudes to the changing times of the world in America. Speaking of the Beatles, Mark David Chapman was super into the Beatles. He loved to listen to their music. He loved to play their music. He even loved to play his own songs because he was inspired by the Beatles. Um, he was just very into the 60s and the Beatles were the 60s. Mark was super into the music and then he got super into drugs and his high school, Columbia High School, was even reported as being rated the number one school for drugs in the whole state. And Mark was all about it. He got super into the drug scene and he became what was known as a quote unquote garbage head because he would literally take anything and everything. It sounds like Mark just liked to party. But the problem was, is while all this was happening, he, Mark David Chapman was pretty young. I mean, by the age of 15, he was already getting into trouble. He was already into drugs. He was already getting really rebellious. He even ran away from home and ended up getting arrested while he was on LSD. This is when he was only 15 years old. Mark David Chapman ended up getting his life together when he was still a teenager, when he found religion. He said that Jesus Christ came into his life and that he didn't realize he was there at first, but that he was and that he saved him and that he went from being a dope head to a Jesus head and that it was just like a really great thing for him. He really loved God. God was his shit at that point. When he was 16 years old, Mark first read the book, A Catcher in the Rye, which is a book that will come up a few times in the story, but he first read it when he was 16, the same age as the main character in the book, a boy named Holden Caulfield. And he started to turn himself into this character to relate to the written word. At one point, The Catcher in the Rye was on top was on the top of the list of the most banned books in American classrooms, a quote-unquote crusade against phoniness. The book is about a young man's descent into despair as he watches the world he's in and the people that are in it and the character of the world just plunge into darkness. It was because of this book and Mark's connection with it and the theme of losing yourself and the majesty of childhood that Mark actually got a job as a teenager working at a summer camp so that he could be around kids. One of his supervisors said that he was particularly great with kids. Like, this guy had never seen a kid his age be so good with other kids. Then he was even made an assistant director after winning an award for quote-unquote outstanding counselor. 
And those who knew him during that time when he was a camp counselor and working with kids said that he was an exceptional employee. So, I don't know. It was when he was 17 that Mark met a woman named Judy and the two fell just madly in love. Well, when I say woman, I mean girl. She was only 15 years old. So they were as in love as a 15-year-old and a 17-year-old can be. But she said, she, she's done interviews after, and she says that they were very in love, that they were in a very good relationship. She said that Mark was just different. He had a different way of thinking about things. He felt differently about things. He was just a different guy. She said that the two of them had a very open and honest and raw and vulnerable relationship. But in the end, the two just didn't work out. And it was Judy herself who ended the relationship. She says that Mark never moved on. He never like accepted that it was over and grew from the experience and moved on and took the new knowledge and life experiences from a failed relationship and applied it to a new relationship. He just held on to her and his heart. And years after he was arrested, and at this time he was even married to somebody else, he still referred to Judy as the love of his life. I've watched interviews with Judy, and it doesn't seem like she loves Mark anymore, but she definitely seems to acknowledge that there was a point in time where he was very important and influential to her, and that their relationship mattered. And she has said of him, and I quote, It's a very hard thing to think about him spending the rest of his years there, you know, because he was such a special person, such a kind and gentle, very gentle person. She said through tears how she doesn't trivialize what he's done and feels so much empathy for Yoko and the people who love John Lennon. But she truly believes that Mark wasn't in his right mind when he did what he did, because it was just so not the person she knew. But there were several years between the person she knew and the person who killed John Lennon, right? So people do change, people can change, and it's a good, there's a good chance that he wasn't the person that she knew, you know? Yeah. So the first time that Mark got, you know, a little bit annoyed with John Lennon, the first time John was put on Mark's radar in a negative light was in 1966, when John said something that just irked Mark a little bit, it hit his ear a bit weird. And that was, and I quote, we're more popular than Jesus now. Mark found this to be blasphemous. He also took issues with the lyrics of the song Imagine, which he considered to be communist, and he took big issue with the song entitled God. Mark has said of his feelings towards John Lennon's lyrics, and I quote, I would listen to his music and I would get angry at him for saying that he didn't believe in God, that he just believed in him and Yoko and he didn't believe in the Beatles. This was another thing that angered me, even though this record had been done at least 10 years previously. I just wanted to scream out loud, who does he think he is saying these things about God and heaven and the Beatles, saying that he doesn't believe in Jesus and things like that. At that point, my mind was going through a total blackness of anger and rage. And about that quote, even though John Lennon was not actually taking a stab at God or religion, at least not in the quote where he said the Beatles were bigger than Jesus. He was actually talking about how the Beatles as a band were compared to religious belief in England at the time. People in the Bible Belt of America did not respond positively to that quote. There were even stations set up in Alabama. I believe there were 10 in Alabama alone where you could go and turn in your Beatle records to be destroyed. And there are photos of people like stomping on their records, ripping up their posters, just being really, really intense. It was very gnarly. Anyways, back to Mark. He worked at that summer camp, the camp with kids for many years, I believe seven years. And while there he went by the nickname Nemo, but then, then he found out that the nickname Nemo actually meant literally nobody. So he decided to no longer go by that nickname. And that's a random thought, but it just makes you think that he wanted to be somebody. So he didn't like going by the nickname nobody. After leaving the camp in 1975, he was sent to Fort Chaffee in Arkansas to help refugee children from Vietnam. It was here that the first changes were noted within him. He just seemed off. It was hard to put a finger on what exactly but where before he was well-liked, social, and popular, here he just kind of stuck to himself. It was said that here is where he had his first sexual experience and that he felt a bit of shame about it. And I'm not sure if that's related, but people did notice that this was the beginning of a big shift in Mark and who he was as a person. 
His face was different. His eyes were cold. He just did not seem like the same old Mark to those who knew him. Shortly after this, Mark decided he needed a, just a big change. He needed to start over fresh. He needed something new in his life, right? He had just gone through a big change in his job. He had just lost the woman that he thought that he loved, the one that he describes as the love of his life. So he decided to uproot his life and make the giant move to Hawaii. And he wasn't going to Hawaii to find peace, to reinvent himself, to escape the world that he lived in. Well, he kind of was trying to escape the world that he lived in. But let me explain. Mark, his plan was to go and get a hotel on Waikiki Beach. He was going to blow through all of his money that he had. And once he was out of funds, he was going to kill himself in Hawaii. This was his plan. That June, Mark actually did try. He took his car. He went down to the beach. He took his exhaust pipe and like made like a hose thing into his window to try to kill himself by asphyxiation on the beach. But he ended up being saved because a fisherman came upon his car and knocked on the window. It was like, you okay in there? Everything cool? And so his plan was thwarted. And this was just like the first big thing that Mark had ever done that showed that he was having like a bit of a mental crisis. And this was just three years before he would commit his murder. But he took, it's weird because he took surviving this suicide attempt as a sign from God that he was supposed to live. And he decided that he wanted to, you know, not take his gift of life for granted. And he wanted to do all he could to be better. So he allowed himself to be hospitalized so that he could get the help that he needed. And what's super weird and that I don't understand is after being hospitalized in Hawaii, he ended up getting hired at the hospital that treated him for trying to kill himself. And I was like, what? That's odd. I don't know why I thought that was so odd, but I did. And he ended up getting hired there. And then he got fired there, got fired from there. And then he got rehired again. And then he got in like a screaming match with another nurse and he got fired again and finally decided he wasn't going to try to work there anymore. So he got a job as a security guard and started heavily drinking. So his new lease on life didn't last that long. To those who knew him, there was just something up with Mark. There was something, there was some sort of darkness in him. You could see it behind the eyes. And despite this, though, he did actually end up meeting a woman in 1978 named Gloria. He had actually hired her to help him book a six week tour around the world, which I don't know where you're going in six weeks, but she ended up helping him because she was a travel agent. And when the two started to get to know each other, they really hit it off and they actually ended up getting married. Despite his new love, though, his depression still persisted and wasn't getting better. If anything, it was getting worse. And he didn't understand why he was literally living in paradise. He was living on Hawaii with a woman who loved him. And still he was plagued with intense unhappiness, which is sad. It's sad when anyone's that sad, you know, anytime a person's sad enough to actually try to kill themselves, it blows my mind. Cause I know how sad I've been. I've been sad in my life, man, but I've never been sad enough to do that. So I can't imagine what that feels like. Um, oh, and fun fact, fun fact, I guess you could say is Mark and Gloria, still married to this day, even after what he's done. Isn't that crazy? They have married all this time and they get one conjugal visit a year. And I just thought you'd want to know that because I cannot unknow that. <laughs> In 1980, Mark decided that he needed to do something. He needed to do anything to try to make himself happier. And this is when he decided that he was going to go to a library on Honolulu and he was going to read every single book that the library had to offer, which is a pretty good thing for any person to do. However, it was while there that Mark David Chapman was reunited, reacquainted with the book, A Catcher in the Rye. And he said that he felt immediately connected and drawn to the book. It was like reuniting with an old friend. It was also at this library that he picked up a book about John Lennon and John Lennon's life called John Lennon One Day at a Time. And in reading this book, he got upset at some of the stuff he learned at John Lennon's perceived phoniness. He said to himself that John Lennon was a fake. He was a phony. He said that John was a fake advocate for peace and that his protests against the war were just phony publicity stunts. And he thought about the catcher in the rye and how in the book Holden was trying to stop children from falling off this metaphorical cliff. And that was them going into adulthood and becoming phonies themselves. And he said that he himself had fallen off the cliff, but had not become an adult. And he decided at that time, that he was going to kill John Lennon. 
and this was months before the actual crime occurred. Mark's wife, Gloria, is quoting, <laughs> saying of her husband's distaste for John Lennon, and I quote, He was angry that Lennon would preach love and peace, but yet have millions. Mark himself said of this, and I quote, He told us to imagine no possessions, and there he was, with millions of dollars and yachts and farms and country estates laughing at people like me who had believed the lies and bought the records and built a big part of their lives around his music. On October 23rd of 1980, Mark David Chapman signed out of work for the last time. He like signed his, uh, his timesheet or whatever, and he ended up signing it John Lennon. Four days later, he bought a gun. He then spent the next few days and weeks um, hanging out in his Honolulu apartment, listening to Beatles records, and planning his crime. He then went to New York for a week where he had waited out and tried to find John Lennon, but was somehow unsuccessful. I'm not sure if maybe he was having cold feet or what, but he did not end up finding John Lennon or connecting with John Lennon, rather. He then traveled to Atlanta to a place that he was familiar with because that's where he had grown up. And while he was there, he bought a bunch of ammo and he went out into like the forest or an open field, like somewhere remote, and did target practice. It was an area that he knew and that he was comfortable with. Apparently after that, instead of heading right back to New York, he actually flew back to Hawaii again because he was second-guessing his choices, he says, and that he wanted to change what he was doing. He went back, he told his wife his plan, he told his wife that he was thinking of killing John Lennon, that that's what he wanted to do. He showed her the bullets, he showed her the gun, and she didn't do anything. She didn't call police. She didn't try to get him mental help. Nothing. Apparently he made himself an appointment to be evaluated clinically for his mental health issues, but he never went to that appointment. On Saturday, December 6th, Mark David Chapman arrived back in New York City. This is where both John Lennon lived and the catcher in the ride took place. Mark then literally tried to live out his own version of a catcher in the ride. He wandered around for three days. He went to Central Park to ask where the ducks went in the winter. He stayed in a cheap hotel just to complain about the noise. And the last night in the hotel, he hired a sex worker who refused to have sex with her and paid her double the going rate and sent her on her way. Mark says that these parallels, these obvious um, recreations of the book were just coincidence that he wasn't trying to copy the book, um, but that he took them as signs that he was doing the right thing. But to me, that sounds a little like bullshit. It seems like he was trying to recreate the book, but let me know what you think. That Monday, December 8th, 1980, Mark David Chapman slept in a little bit that day. He got a little cozy, slept till 1030, which I guess was late for him. Um, and by that time, he was staying in a nicer hotel that was closer to the Dakota where John Lennon lived. That day before he left, he like laid out this display on the, I believe it was the dresser that was in the hotel room before leaving the hotel for the day. On the dresser, he had laid out his Bible, his passport, and a printed out still from the movie The Wizard of Oz, which was his favorite film. Mark David Chapman then left his hotel room with a gun and hollow point bullets. He then went downstairs, he bought a new copy of the book Catcher in the Rye, and he wrote inside the cover to Holden Caulfield from Holden Caulfield, this is my statement. Apparently, he was having second thoughts about doing this. He kept saying over, over and over in his head, don't do it, leave now, go back to the hotel, get in a cab, just do anything else. But he says that he couldn't, that this was what was supposed to happen and that this was fate and you can't stop it. You can't stop it. He literally was saying, you can't fight fate. Not literally, but you know what I mean. He then went to the Dakota, John Lennon's apartment building, and he just waited outside to run into him, hoping he'd either come out or come in and that he would see him. And apparently, um, earlier that day, he had been waiting outside and he actually saw John Lennon's housekeeper and his young son walking up to the building. And he, ugh, it creeps me out. He actually reached out and he shook John Lennon's son, Sean's hand, John Lennon's son's, Sean's hand and called him a quote unquote, beautiful boy, which is the song, the name of a song that John Lennon wrote for his son, Sean. And it gives me like actual full body chills because that's actually the song that me and my husband plan to sing to our baby boy. It's a song that we listen to a lot right now, 
with this little boy growing in my stomach. So it gives me the chills to think about this murderer shaking the hands of the son of the man he's going to kill. You know, it's just like, it's not fucking cool, man. After that, he just stood there and he waited for John Lennon t- to appear. And finally he did. John Lennon was leaving his house with Yoko, but he was leaving in a pretty big hurry. He didn't really have time to socialize much, but Mark still walked up to him and he handed him a copy of Double Fantasy, that album that he had just come out with a couple of months pre- before his latest album. And he just handed it to him silently for a signature. He said nothing to him. So John was like really cool, happy, smiled, signed it for him asked him if he needed anything else, if he wanted anything else, but Mark David Chapman just said nothing to him. While this was happening, a photo was taken of this interaction by a photographer named Paul Gorsh, I think was his name, who just happened to be standing by. And this photo, if you've seen it, I'll, I'll obviously I'm going to post it. And this photo was one of the last photos ever taken of John Lennon alive, him standing there signing a copy of an album with his murderer. Yoko Ono has said that this photo, the photo of the two of them standing together and interacting is harder for her to look at than the actual death photos of his murder, which I get. And I I don't know why Mark David Chapman didn't strike then, but he didn't. John and Yoko left that day and did a whole bunch of things. They did a photo shoot um, for a photographer who actually shoots for Rolling Stone, Rolling Stone, you know, the magazine. I think it's a magazine now. Now it's mostly online, but you know what I mean. And in this photo, uh, John Lennon posed nude alongside Yoko Ono. And you can find this photo. He, He loved this picture. I remember I read this. I didn't put this down to say, but he loved this photo. He looked at it and said, like, that's it. That's our relationship. And if you search it, you can find it. It's kind of her laying down and him kind of like holding her like he's a little baby and he's butt naked. Now, don't search John Lennon naked unless you want like a lot of results because I did not know this until I did my research, but John Lennon loved to be naked. He was just hanging brain everywhere. He went, I saw way more pictures of his peen than I meant to when I started my research. But yeah, if you search that there's a lot that will come up. Apparently he was very free, but if you, I don't know what you need to search specifically to just find the album cover, (laughs) but, um, just know going in, that there are a lot of nude photos of John Lennon on the internet that I had no idea. (laughs) Anyways, after doing that photo shoot, he actually went and did an interview. And in this interview, he actually talked about life and getting older, which is very sad in hindsight. And he said in this interview, and I quote, I consider that my work won't be finished until I'm dead and buried. And I hope that's a long, long time. How eerie is it for him to say that just the day that he was murdered? Later that night at approximately 10 50 PM, John Lennon and his wife, Yoko Ono arrived back home. They had had a really long day. They had been at the recording studio. They were just ready to get home and relax and unwind after just a long day of doing so many things. Can you even imagine? And instead of getting to go in and relax and hang out with his wife and his son, he was murdered instead. And he was 40 years old. When John first got out of the car, he made eye contact with Mark David Chapman, who was still standing outside of his building. And Mark has said that he could tell by John's face that he recognized him from seeing him earlier that day, but just continued to walk by with his wife. And he says that as John and Yoko went to enter their apartment building, he pulled out the gun and fired five shots at the couple. Mark says that he was surprised by how John died because he was shocked when he shot John once and he didn't just fall down dead immediately there, like in the movies, he was just blown away. Like, how could this be? Um, so then he shot him four more times and he said that John had four holes in his body because he shot him four times with a 38 caliber gun with hollow point bullets. John Lennon then ran into his apartment building crying and yelling and saying his final words, which were just simply, I'm shot. And Yoko Ono, who had been hiding at this point, because when the the gun started going off, she like hid to to try to protect herself, realized that her husband had been attacked and he had been shot and she ran to be by his side. The doorman of John Lennon's building, I believe he was a man named Jose, then ran outside, disarmed Mark David Chapman and kicked the gun away from him, which is just brave as hell, right? Like we all need a Jose, right? We all need a Jose. 
Um, and then at that point, Mark, instead of running, just sat down, pulled out the copy of A Catcher in the Rye that he brought with him, and started to read the book and just wait to be arrested. Three hours later, he was in custody, and he said to the police, and I quote, I'm sure the big part of me is Holden Caulfield, who is the main person in the book. The small part of me must be the devil. In one breath, Mark David Chapman will say he doesn't know why he chose John Lennon, but in then another breath, he says things like this. The reason I killed John Lennon was to gain prominence and to promote the reading of J.D. Salinger's A Catcher in the Rye. I'm not saying I'm the Messiah or nothing like that. If you read the book and if you understand my past, you would see that I am indeed the Catcher in the Rye of this generation. Mark David Chapman had also contemplated killing other public figures, including Johnny Carson, Paul McCartney, and Ronald Reagan. John Lennon was mostly a choice of convenience. He said that, like, he was done, done with the world, and figured that killing John Lennon would be the end of him, that this sort of self-destruction would immediately end his life. Then he goes on to talk about the catcher in the rye and how, really, in the book, Holden wanted to die. And another thing about this case that I did not know that's so crazy to me is, okay, Mark David Chapman actually had a hit list, and apparently David Bowie was on this hit list. And when he learned of everything that happened and that he was on the hit list, he said of this, and I quote, I was second on his list. Chapman had a front row ticket to the Elephant Man the next night. John and Yoko were supposed to sit front row for that show too. So the night after John was killed, there were three empty seats in the front row. I can't tell you how difficult that was to go on. I almost didn't make it through the performance. Can you imagine how scary that would be to learn? That's one of the first facts that I told my husband about when I finished all my research. I was like, did you know this? And he's like, why would I know that? And I was like, why didn't I know that? You know, <laughs> Mark told police that he could tell by the lyrics of one of John Lennon's songs called Watching the Wheels, that John Lennon knew that he was going to die, that he had accepted his fate, and that he knew that him, John Lennon, and Mark David Chapman's paths were going to cross. The lyrics he's discussing, I believe, are, and I quit. I'm just sitting here watching the wheels go round and round. I really love to watch them roll, no longer riding on the merry-go-round. I just had to let it go. And apparently this quote just made Mark David Chapman think it was fate, because apparently there's a carousel theme in The Catcher in the Rye that basically is supposed to be a symbolization of youth and innocence. Mark David Chapman said of his interaction with John Lennon the day that he murdered him, and I quote, He was very kind to me. Ironically, very kind and very patient with me. The limousine was waiting, and he took his time with me, and he got his pen going, and he signed my album. He asked if I needed anything else. I said, no, no, sir. And he walked away. Very cordial and decent man. John Lennon was killed almost instantly. Um, he was really tore up. He was bleeding so much that he couldn't even wait for an ambulance. They actually loaded his body into the back of a cop car, and they rushed him to the hospital. And when he arrived, he was pronounced dead at 11.07 p.m. The United States learned of John Lennon's murder during a Monday night football game, and from there, the news quickly spread all over the world. In the days that followed his murder, the world mourned John Lennon's passing with his wife and his former bandmates in the Beatles. Groups of people were hanging out outside the Dakota where John was shot, and radio stations played nothing but the Beatles hits. And then later that December of 1980, a candlelight vigil was held outside the Dakota building. Because, you know, that's where he lived and where he died. And people were just standing out there and trying to honor him. And there were actually candlelight vigils held all over the world. But this is the one I'm talking about specifically. So I'm, I want to talk about the one that happened outside the Dakota. People stood there with their candles and their signs. And they stood together and they sang together. They were all just singing different songs that John Lennon wrote to try to honor him. And what's crazy to me, this is another fact that I did not know and it blew my mind when I read it. Are you ready for this? Okay. At the candlelight vigil outside the Dakota, John Hinckley was there. John Hinckley is the man who shot Ronald Reagan. Okay, apparently, apparently, when he was at the vigil, he had a gun in his pocket then as well. Four months later, he did what he did. And when police went and arrested him, they found, guess, guess what they found? A paperback copy of A Catcher in the Rye. Isn't that ass bananas? I'm sorry, like what? <laughs> what? 
Anyways, it's just craziness. Though the public was pretty open with mourning John Lennon, Yoko was pretty private about it. She ended up having a private funeral. I don't think she invited like anybody. And then after John was cremated, she scattered his ashes in like an undisclosed location. Though it has been said that it was probably in Central Park, it's undisclosed. You know what I mean? Oh man, you know who was not allowed to mourn in private? Members of the Beatles, man. Like, of course, the media had to know how each and every member of the Beatles felt about losing their friend. Paul McCartney, who was cornered leaving a music studio, was infamously quoted as saying, and I quote, it's a drag. And people hella criticized him for this comment, but Paul was later like, bro, there was a reporter, and we were trying to drive away, and he just like stuck out a microphone in the window and shouted, what do you think about John's death? And I had just finished a whole day, and I was in shock, and I just said, it's a drag. And I meant, it's a drag in the heaviest sense of the word. Ringo Starr was in the Bahamas at the time that Lennon was killed, and when he heard what happened, he flew to New York and went straight to the Dakota and asked Yoka how he could help. She told him that he could keep Sean, her and John's son, occupied, and so that's what he did. As for George Harrison, he said of John and his death, and I quote, After all we went through together, I had and still have great love and respect for him. I am shocked and stunned. To rob a life is the ultimate robbery in life. The perpetual encroachment on other people's space is taken to the limit with the use of a gun. It's an outrage that people can take other people's lives away when they obviously haven't got their own lives in order. So Mark was arrested and he was charged with second degree murder. Even though the whole thing was super planned and he even brought hollow point bullets to ensure that John Lennon would die, he was still charged with second degree, even though it definitely sounds like first degree murder to me, but I know that there are different laws in New York. The prosecution claimed that Mark David Chapman killed John Lennon to be famous, but the defense said that he did it because he was insane. Psychiatrists kind of went back and forth between Mark knowing who he was, knowing that he was Mark Chapman, but also thinking that he was Holden Caulfield. More than a dozen psychologists and psychiatrists interviewed him in the six months prior to his trial. Many of the defense experts concluded that Mark was psychotic and paranoid schizophrenic, and the prosecution experts um, declared that the delusions fell short of psychosis, and instead, they thought that he had personality disorders. They also had specific court-appointed experts, and these experts said that he was kind of off his rocker, but he, that he was competent to stand trial. And off his rocker is a technical term, okay? Okay. What was really weird to me when I was reading about all of his psychological examinations is that he was said to have been more cooperative with the prosecution's examiners than the defense's examiners. It was thought that he did not want to be seen as crazy, that he didn't want people thinking he did what he did because he was crazy, and that he believed that the only reason the defense was trying to say that he was crazy is because it was their job to get him off, but that he wasn't crazy. So this case was wild, as I'm sure you can imagine. Fans of Lennon were not playing around, and apparently his initial um, court-appointed attorney, a man named Herbert, actually withdrew because he had threats of being lynched for representing Chapman. And people were worried, like um, authorities were worried that people were going to storm the hospital that he was staying at. So they actually transferred him to, I believe, Rikers Island for his protection. At his initial hearing in January of 1981, his new attorney, what was his name? Like Joseph? Doesn't matter. His new attorney advised him that he should be pleading not guilty based on temporary insanity or based on being insane, just in general. I don't think it was temporary, just insanity. And initially that was what they were talking about. That's what they were discussing doing. But as the trial approached, Mark was like, listen, I don't want to do that. I want to plead guilty based on the fact that this was God's will. And his attorney was like, bro, you're making my job so fucking difficult. But he, that's what he did. And the judge concluded that he was able to enter the plea he wanted to, to enter and that he was competent to stand trial, so there was nothing that could be done. Mark David Chapman pled guilty without any sort of fight, so evidence didn't really have to be presented. No one really had to hear him talk. He was just guilty, and it was obvious anyways. He was sentenced to 20 years to life, which is five years less than the maximum sentence of 25 years to life, and he had the stipulation that mental health treatment would be provided. Yoko Ono has said of her late husband, and I quote, He's still alive. He's still with us. His spirit will go on. You can't kill a person that easily. And that's maybe one of the most noteworthy things about John Lennon and his death is that he is, his spirit is very much alive in that, in just the, the millions of people who still flock to his music 
all the time, even after all these years. And, um, it's, it's definitely something that's kind of wild. And Yoko Ono actually, um, with the help of like city officials was able to make this really nice tribute to her, her late husband. A few months after his death, the city named a small section of Central Park Strawberry Fields after one of the most iconic Beatles songs. Fans regularly go to honor John Lennon at the uh, Central Park Strawberry Fields area, which is close to his old apartment building anyways. And in the years since, this little area of the park has become a memorial for John. It's an area that's pretty large. It's like two and a half acres. And there's a circular black and white marble mosaic impressed with the word imagine at its center which is supposed to be a sort of, you know, a little nod to one of John's most famous songs, Imagine. Initially, Mark David Chapman refused to give any interviews to the press. I think for the first six years he was in prison, he didn't give any interviews because he says that he didn't want to give the impression that he had killed John Lennon, 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 for any sort of fame or notoriety. But he later admitted that that's exactly why he did it, because he didn't want to be Nemo. Nobody. He didn't say that, the Nemo part. I did, but I think that it's fitting. Mark David Chapman is now in his late 60s and he has applied for parole 11 times and each time it has been rejected. I believe his next attempt that he, or the next time he can try for parole is in 2022, so next year. At his latest parole hearing, he said, and I quote, I just wanna reiterate that I'm sorry for my crime. I have no excuse. This was for self-glory. I think it's the worst crime that there could be to do something to someone that's innocent. He was extremely famous. I didn't kill him because of his character, the kind of man he was. He was a family man. He was an icon. He was someone that spoke of things that now we can speak of, and it's great. I assassinated him, to use your word earlier, because he was very, very, very famous. And that's the only reason. And I was very, 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 very much seeking self-glory. Very selfish. I want to add that and emphasize that greatly. It was an extremely selfish act. I'm sorry for the pain that I caused to her. I think about it all the time. Mark often says that justice isn't served and that if any crime deserves the death penalty, it's his because he knowingly planned out every bit of the crime and that he went into it knowing that John was innocent and that what he was doing was wrong. And he also says that if he was kept in prison forever and never given parole, he would be just fine but he keeps applying. So I don't know if I believe that he feels that way. Every single time he has a parole hearing, Yoko Ono sends in a letter um, expressing to the board that she does not want him released. So I don't really think he ever will be released. I feel like people who murder famous people are seldomly let out of jail. You know what I mean? I, I can't think of one that was. So I really don't think he would be. I don't think it would be accepted. Well, he probably wouldn't be very safe, so I don't know why he would want to, but um, I don't know, man. The New York State Department of Correction and Community Supervision Board said to Mark David Chapman of his crime, and I quote, Your violent act caused devastation to not only family and former band members, but the world. And with that statement, that, my friends, is the story of the life and tragic death of John Lennon. And now with all of that said, come gather around and let me tell you the story of the heartbreaking murder of beloved comedian Phil Hartman. Our story begins in the early morning hours of May 28th, 1998, and this was in Encino, California, which is in the Los Angeles County. Police received a call from a man, and the man told the dispatcher that shots had been fired and one person had been killed. So police rush over to the home, and when they arrive there, it's about 6.30 in the morning, and they find that there are several people inside the house, including two small children. So they evacuate the home, mostly. There was one living holdout. This was a woman named Bryn Hartman, and she had barricaded herself in her bedroom, and this was a bedroom where just hours before she had murdered her husband. Police tried to talk to Bryn through the door. They tried to defuse the situation. They were hoping that they could get her out safely, but then they heard a gunshot. So they entered the room, and they found two people dead in their bed. This was Bryn Hartman, and she had taken her own life with a single gunshot wound, and lying beside her was her husband, 49-year-old Phil Hartman, and he had been shot multiple times. Now, Phil Hartman, known as the man of a thousand voices and a thousand faces, was one of the most beloved comedians like ever. He had countless jobs as an actor and a writer on TV shows and movies, and he was well known for the eight seasons that he spent on Saturday Night Live. 
but before he was known and loved to the world at large, he was just a little boy from a large Canadian family. Phil was born September 24th, 1948, and he was the fourth child of eight kids born to parents Rupert and Doris. Rupert worked as a salesman, and Doris worked, she did odd jobs making, you know, money here and there, trying to do whatever she could to make ends meet because she was raising eight kiddos. So because of this, because she was out of the house a lot, you know, Rupert was out of the house a lot, the kids didn't really get like a ton of attention. I mean, don't get me wrong, there was love there. I didn't read anything that said there wasn't like, it wasn't like a loving family, but logistically, people were busy. And all of the extra time that the parents did have had to be allocated to Phil's little sister because she had this rare disorder. So the other kids just didn't get as much of, you know, the attention that kids so often require. They like to be looked at. They like to be paid attention to. But when you don't have the time, you're working a lot. You have so many kids. One of the kids has an issue. Some kids are just going to get less attention than they may like to have. This might be why as Phil grew up, he kind of had an issue with feeling unvalidated and he just wanted attention from people, you know, and he found quickly from like a young age, from like a little guy that he could get that attention from entertaining. And he would do that as often as he could. He found that this made him especially popular with his siblings. And he had a lot of those to sit and practice his little entertaining skills. And that was kind of his thing. He would do anything he could to make people laugh, to make people smile. That was how he got his happiness. And he found that he had a real knack for doing impressions and he would just crack his siblings up. So he practiced that and kind of fine tuned that skill when he was just a little, little guy. Anyways, his family stayed in Canada because remember Canadian family stayed in Canada until Phil was about 10 years old. And then they came down to the United States here and they bounced around a little bit before finally settling in California, which is like, you know, the perfect place for a budding potential star, right? Right. In high school, Phil was popular. He was super active socially. He did all the extracurricular things, but what was most notable was his participate participation his participation in drama. He even went on to be voted the class clown. And this made him super popular with his peers, right? Anybody who's super funny, kids love, kids, everyone loves that, right? We love to laugh, except for Phil's teachers. They didn't love it quite as much because, you know, it made him a bit disruptive. He was always cracking jokes. He was being a class clown. I was a class clown. My teachers did not like me. <laughs> I wasn't like Phil Hartman funny, but they still were not a fan. And you know what, speaking of Phil's high school career, whatever, this doesn't matter, but it's something that I found interesting and something I want to tell you. It's just like a little fun fact to people. In Phil's graduating class, there was a girl named Lynette Frome. And you might recognize that name. And that's because Lynette Frome was a Manson girl. Squeaky. Squeaky from the Manson family. She was in Phil's graduating class. I just thought that was crazy. And I wanted to tell you about it. So now I know that. I know you know that. Anyways, after high school, Phil went on to go to college and in college, he was still seen as like the funny guy. So even though Phil was in drama and did like it and did succeed at that, he didn't actually pursue that in college. He didn't think that he could make a living doing acting. So he decided to pursue something else that he was good at. He was one of those people actually who was good at everything, music, comedy, acting, and art. And that's what he pursued in college. He was really, really good at it. He even went on to draw like cartoons for the school newspaper. He did leave college for a little bit and then ended up coming back later. And when he did, he again, continued pursuing art and he got a degree in graphic design. And he actually went on to work for his brother's like music company and designed album covers, like popular album covers. Phil Hartman's the one who designed them. Now Phil went on to get his first taste of like the live performance bug when his brother, John and John's friends opened up a venue called Kaleidoscope. Now this venue wasn't open very long, but it was super popular in the music scene when it was open. And this was a place where Phil flourished, which made sense because he was a big music guy, like one of the older brothers, one of his older brothers, and they worked together with some bands and he went to like a lot of shows and met a lot of famous musicians. He even worked as a roadie touring around for a bit. Like it truly sounds like this guy did everything and knew everyone. He just did so much cool shit and made so many friends. He had this type of personality that just made everyone want to know him. Now, as popular as Phil was with his friends, he was equally popular with the ladies. He was hot. He was funny. He was friends with musicians. And, you know, ladies love that shit. And he was the type of guy that was always joking and laughing. But he was also the type of guy that when he loved, he seemed to love big and he loved deep. And he would write all these love poems and, you know, be all in, but he also seemed like he loved the idea of love more. Like it was more in theory good for him than in practice. If you know what I mean? I feel like we know people like that, that are like 
these giant romantics and it's all in, all in, all in. But then when you're really in the situation, you're like, oh, this is real life. It's not quite as fun as what I had in my head. It was said that Phil was the type of guy who you really never knew, like the real Phil. He joked so much and pretended to be so many people that to actually see a glimpse inside him was rare. But who he really was, was a guy who was very deep, very introspective, someone who was just super curious about life and death and the universe, and very people knew and saw this Phil. And when it came to love, it sounds like he would chase, right? He'd get these big, big feelings and then he'd chase the person, then he'd get in the relationship and then it would kind of fizzle out. But then when it ended, he, it would be super dramatic and it would be like the world was ending. And so this cycle kind of happened a lot and he bounced around a bit from lady to lady. He just wasn't the type of guy to get tied down. He wasn't settling it down. That was until he met a woman named Gretchen Lewis while on a beach in 1968. Apparently what happened is Gretchen was just walking down the beach with her dog, which was a poodle named Noodle, I know, kill me, so cute, and Phil saw her, and he was mesmerized. The stew, the stew, the two started to talk, they spent the day together, they had so much fun, they made plans to see each other the next day, and before you knew it, they were dating, they were all into each other, and it was filled with Le Passio. The relationship between Gretchen and Phil moved super fast and was very intense, but this was kind of commonplace for Phil. He'd get in a relationship, it would go really hot and heavy, but then Phil seemed to sort of withdraw into himself emotionally, especially if there were problems, if there was drama. He just wasn't the type to like want to deal with them. But before they got to that point, things were good. They got together, they ended up getting married, they moved in with a friend for a little bit before getting their own place. And it seems like once the realities of like being married and being in a committed relationship kind of sunk in, they both just kind of got bored. He withdrew emotionally from her, she kind of went to work and started having a little flirtation with the guy. And even though there wasn't any reported cheating, it just, there was a rift between them and it didn't work out and they did end up getting a divorce. It was said to be amicable though, like they didn't hate each other. They'd only known each other about four years when this happened, like they met, got married and were divorced all within the span of four years. And it was amicable, like they didn't hate each other. Now, it was shortly after the divorce from Gretchen the following year that Phil got his first sort of break into comedy. Him and his friends had gone to this comedy club and they were hanging out and the mic was unattended. Like there was a lull, the show wasn't starting it. And he was like, you know what I think would be fun? If I took this opportunity to go up there and kind of entertain everybody while they're waiting. So he actually did. He went up and took the unattended mic and he started, you know, filling around as one does. And he was getting laughs. He was super funny. Does Phil Hartman. And people were noticing it. The regulars at the comedy club were noticing it. The people that were supposed to be performing but weren't up there yet were noticing it. And Phil had so much fun. So after the show, he actually went and found, I believe it was the owner of the club or the person who ran this comedy group. It was called The Groundlings. And he's like, how do I join? Because it sounds like a really fun time. And the rest was history. He did. He joined. He had fun. And now he was able to perform comedy live. I don't know why I forgot that sentence, but I did <laughs> perform comedy life. Him joining this group really was the thing that like pushed his career in that direction. Right. And with practice came perfection and Phil started to be really successful. He started moving up successfully in the success ladder. Sure. And he started getting jobs, doing radio shows, doing commercials, TV and movies. Like this was a great move for him. It was after this, after joining the Groundlings, that Phil met his next wife. And this was a girl named Lisa. And apparently she was very different for, for him, like a different match. He called her a firecracker. The two met at a restaurant. And as soon as he met her, he was infatuated with her. He was very interested in her. He needed to get to know her. So he asked her for her number. But nobody like had a pen at the restaurant, which I thought was very weird. Like you got to fill out tips, right? I don't know. It doesn't matter. Nobody had a pen. So he memorized her number. He's like, I got this. He memorized her number. He called her the very next day and they started dating. This relationship again moved super fast. I mean, one of their first dates was actually to a wedding, which is like a choice, but they were really into each other. They got married, but then just as quickly as it began, it fizzled out. It seems like when it came to Lisa and Phil, they just weren't really compatible with each other's needs. And she felt um, at the time that they separated that he didn't even like want to be with her anymore. So they get a divorce and this one was less amicable. It was a bit of a harder divorce and there was a lot of back and forth. They tried to get back together and the magic was just gone. And it seems like this was really sad because they really did seem to love each other. Even though they didn't work out, they kind of con they considered each other soulmates. Phil considered her to be his soulmate. 
And they never got back together. They did end up being friends after, you know, the rough patch after they were, you know, healed enough to do so. They did end up being friends, but it seems like he would have liked it if they could have gotten back together. She definitely seemed like the one that got away from him. And he said later in life, like, she was that one. She was my soulmate. And like, that's who I should have ended up with. Anyways, SNL, the big boys. So many great people have been on SNL. We've got Fred Armisen. We have Adam Sandler. We have Andy Sandler. We have Keenan Thompson. We have Bill Hader. Love Bill Hader. So underrated. We have Will Ferrell. We have Eddie Murphy. Like this is where the funny people be going. Let me know down below your favorite people who have ever been on SNL, because I'd like to know, because I'd love to see people's, you know, people's taste in comedy, I think tells a lot. So let me know who you think was the funniest person on SNL in the comments. But anyway, so Phil Hartman finally auditioned to be on SNL in 1986. And this was after he had actually already been asked to do so and had just like not done it. So he finally auditions. It goes super well and they want him to join the cast. And you would think for like most people, you would be jumping at the, the chance to join SNL. But apparently Phil was kind of cool on it. He wasn't sure if it was something he wanted to do. And this is kind of weird because it has been said that all you need is one year performing on SNL to like make it in Hollywood. Like if you've done this, you are going to be fine. But for Phil, he wasn't sure. It would mean moving from California to New York. And he loved California at the time that this was happening. He also had a new girlfriend, a woman named Bryn. So he'd have to take his relationship into consideration. And at this time, SNL, even though it seems like it's been on forever and it's been kind of untouchable at this time, it was kind of going through a rocky point and it needed kind of a revival. So he wasn't sure if this is what he wanted to do, but ultimately he did end up making that move. He did end up joining SNL and he went on to be a writer and an actor on the show. And for the eight seasons that he was on SNL, he was beloved. Now, initially when Phil went to New York, he didn't bring his new girlfriend Brent with him. The, their relationship had been kind of on again and off again. And it didn't feel stable enough to do like a cross country move together. But after a bit of time in New York, he went back to California for a visit. And when he came back to New York from that visit, he brought Brent with him. Now, Phil and Bryn met because they were set up on a blind date in 1985. Bryn was a beautiful woman from Minnesota who had previously been married when she was super young, but had divorced and had done a bit of modeling before moving to Hollywood, California, where she continued pursuing, pursuing, pursuing her dreams of modeling and acting. Her move to California and the pursuit of this career though was hard on her because she didn't really end up where she wanted to be. She did get a few jobs, but nothing serious. And all of this was really tough for a lady who for most of her life had felt like she was destined for more than she had. All of her life, she heard from people that she had the it factor. She had the look. She was tall. She was beautiful. She took acting classes and modeling classes. She changed her name from Vicky Joe to Bryn so she could have that star power and that presence. But it just didn't really happen for her. In Minnesota, she was a big fish in a small pond. But in Hollywood, that wasn't quite the case. Now, I'm not sure if it was the perceived failure or what the cause was, but over the years, once she was in Hollywood, she did develop a little bit of a drug problem and cocaine was her drug of choice. And it did get to the point that she needed to go to rehab. But at the time that Phil and her met, she had, you know, gotten off drugs and she had been sober for several years at the time that they were set up on their date. Now, their relationship. Bryn said that when she first met Phil, she knew he was the one. He was super sweet. He was super funny. She loved all of the passion that he put into every single thing he did. And she was really like a big cheerleader for him because though when they met, he was on his way up, he hadn't quite made a name for himself yet. He wasn't like the Phil Hartman that, you know, we now remember him as. So once they were together, it moved super fast. It moved super hot and heavy, but it was also like a pretty toxic relationship. They fought constantly. They were very on again, off again on a dime but they were together and they were making it work together in New York. Now, New York, great professional move for Phil. He was working on SNL. His career was flourishing. Brins wasn't. And she actually did ask him to try to get her on SNL. Like he, she was like, Hey, a couple comedy duo. That would be, I can't say that would be great. But whenever he would kind of bring it up to people like in the biz world, they were like kind of cool on it. They didn't think that she, was very funny. And Phil didn't seem to think she was very funny either. She did end up getting a role as like an extra, I think in like maybe one episode of SNL, if I remember correctly, but it never really went any farther than that. Her career wasn't progressing, but his was. 
He was getting more acting jobs and voice work. He went on to do several voices for characters on The Simpsons, two of which were recurring roles that were immediately retired upon his death. And he ended up starring in and apparently absolutely crushing it on a show called News Radio. I think he joined this after he left SNL, but I've never seen the show, but my husband speaks very highly of it. He actually asked me to do this case like probably a year ago. Him and my friend Rianne both asked me to do this case like quite a long time ago, but it's very daunting to cover somebody so important to people. Somebody When there's so much information out there, it's very difficult, but he, my husband, loved Phil Hartman and loved news radio. Apparently it was great. At this time, things were really looking up for Phil. Everyone who saw him thought his life was going in the right direction. This was until he started telling friends that after just a year of dating Brent, he was planning on proposing to her. Apparently across the board, no one thought this was the right move for him. Even Elvira, the mistress of the dark who had worked with Phil, but was more importantly, his friend was like, this is a real bad idea, my guy. She had always felt weird about Brent. A lot of his friends had, they noticed that she seemed kind of fake and surface level. And that whenever she was with them, she felt like she seemed like she was on edge and like she was acting, but not well. She seemed very, very desperate to be in their circle, the circle of famous and successful people like she wanted to be. So Elvira tells Phil this. It's like, I don't think this is a good idea. I don't think you should do this. And it actually caused like a riff in their friendship for a while because nobody wants to hear that you shouldn't marry the person you want to marry, right? You hear this and you're just like, well, you suck. What do you know? Like, you don't know our relationship. You don't know her like I know her. So it actually caused a bit of their, a bit of trouble in their friendship for a while. But whether it was for love or whether it was because Bryn was actually pregnant, we will not know for sure. But Phil was intent on marrying Bryn and the two did. They married in 1987 and then went on to have a bouncing baby boy. And then three years later, they had another child. They had a daughter. Both Phil and Bryn were said to be amazing parents. Phil really flourished as a father. He felt a love. He learned that there was a love out there that was like this. He had never felt anything quite like this. You know what I mean? And I feel like if you are a parent, you can understand this. Not to say you cannot feel love if you don't have kids, but it is a very different type of love. And uh, my God, it's in <laughs> it's very intense. And Phil was gone a lot, right? He had like a very um, busy career, but whenever he was home, he was super present, super there with his kids. He played with them. He spent time with them and he had a very good relationship with both of his children. Bryn was also said to be a very good mother. She was very involved in attention and nurturing and maternal, if you will. She was very content as a mother, but she wasn't feeling very fulfilled in her relationship with Phil. She felt like she wasn't getting what she needed emotionally there, right? Like he was withdrawn. And this is something that a lot of his exes say, but you know, they were having problems going into the relationship. So you can't like get married and have kids and hope that it fixes everything. But either way, she was feeling like there wasn't enough of a connection there with her husband. And on top of that, he worked a lot. So he was away a lot. So he was distant physically and distant emotionally. And this was very hard on Brynn and she was very unhappy. She was unhappy. I'm sure with a lot of things, the state of her life, her career, the fact that her marriage wasn't what she wanted it to be. And at this point in her life, she was so unhappy that she actually did relapse on cocaine. Now, this was an issue for Phil. He had never been into drugs. Weed? Sure. Anything else? No. So this was a big point of contention for them. They would fight about this a lot. Bryn would, you know, she would get clean for a little bit and then she would start using again. And it would end up being this yo-yo effect that caused a lot of issues in their relationship. And when Bryn was using cocaine, she was very intense. Their fighting got a lot more intense. She got a lot more aggressive and a lot more erratic. And she would do this in front of the kids. So when she would start using again, Phil would take the kids and he would take them away and leave her. Like he not like leave her permanently, but he wouldn't let her be around the kids during the time that she was using cocaine. It got so bad that Phil threatened to divorce Brit. And Phil didn't want to divorce Brit. Phil was actually not the one to initiate any of his divorces. He never wanted to get divorced, but his wives were always like, I'm done with this relationship and they would leave him. But he got to the point that he's like, I can't do this anymore. I need to protect my sanity and I need to protect our kids. Things were just really bad for them, right? They started on an unstable foundation and marriage and kids didn't help this. They fought all the time. They had a lot of tension. Neither of them were getting what they wanted or needed from their union. And it was clear to everyone that it just wasn't a good match. Phil often joked with his friends and colleagues about him getting divorced again. 
And he said it like he was joking, but also like not like he was joking because it was bad. There was jealousy and resentment on the part of Bryn because Phil was living the life that she wanted and the fights were getting more and more intense with Bryn throwing things and sometimes even getting physical with him. Like she would hit him and she would scratch him. People would see marks on him when he'd come into work for like makeup and stuff. They'd see that he'd been in an altercation and it would get so bad that sometimes he had to physically restrain her just to get her to stop. It just seems like Bryn was a bit of a hothead, you know, like she'd fly off the handle pretty easily, even when she wasn't using drugs. And when she was using drugs, it was even worse. Like, for example, to show like a little bit of an unhinged nature here, when her Bryn and Phil had their first baby, his ex-wife, Lisa, who he was friends with at this point, wrote a letter of congratulations. And Bryn was fucking pissed. She lost it. She wrote Lisa back a letter threatening her, telling her to watch her back, telling her to like stay away from her family. And this probably had a lot to do with the fact that, remember, Lisa was like the one that got away, Phil's soulmate. And Phil had, which kind of isn't nice, but he had told Bryn that he felt this way about Lisa. And it was like a problem in their relationship. It was something that when he and Bryn would fight, she would bring up often. So I'm sure seeing this woman's name and seeing a letter come in from her didn't make her happy. But that's just like not how you respond to somebody. You don't threaten them right? Tell them to watch their backs. So you don't do that. She also wrote a letter to one of Phil's female castmates that she was jealous of, like a crazy letter that he didn't let her send. And she was just like incredibly jealous. She was so, she was jealous that Phil was cheating on her. She was jealous. Phyllis? She was jealous that Phil was even cheating on her with men. Like, okay. She was so jealous that she would hire nannies sometimes, right? That they would have nannies. They had money. They'd have nannies. And Bryn would go out and try to find work sometimes. So they had nannies. She would interview these nannies to make sure they were unattractive before she hired them. And then once she hired them, if Phil was like too friendly, she would just immediately fire them. She was like, absolutely not. You're not going to be nice to anyone but me and my house. Now, all of this is to bring us to May 27th, 1998, a totally normal night until it wasn't. On this night, Bryn had gone out for dinner and drinks with a friend of hers. They went to Buka de Beppu, which, listen, I love Buka. I want Buka now. But anyways, they go out. They have their food. They have their drinks. It's normal. Her friend said that Bryn seemed totally fine. They finished up their evening, and Bryn wanted to, like, keep the party going. She didn't want to go home yet, but her friend was like, bro, it's a Thursday. I'm not really looking to stay up all night and do the whole thing with you. So they parted ways and Bryn, not wanting to go home, decided to go to the house of a friend slash ex-boyfriend of hers named Ron. So she got to Ron's house at about 10 PM and where her girlfriend at Buka said she seemed like fine. Ron said she definitely seemed agitated and on edge. She got there and she had some drinks and as the drinks flowed, she started to, you know, bitch about her life. She complained about Phil. She complained about their relationship. She talked about how the two should separate, how they should just divorce, how she wasn't happy, all that jazz. She stayed at his house for a couple of hours before finally leaving at about 1 a.m. to go back home to Phil and her kids. Now, what happened specifically between Bryn and Phil when she got home that night, we will never know because no one who was in that room that night lived to tell about it. Just before 4 a.m. that night, Ron opened his door to find that Bryn was back on his doorstep, which he didn't want her to be there. I guess she had called him and asked if she could come back, and he was like, no, and then she did it anyway. So she shows up. He opens the door, and she's way more intense this time, way more high energy, erratic. She's in her pajamas. She's barefoot. And as soon as he starts talking to her, like, yo, what are you doing here? It's 4 o'clock in the morning. She immediately is, like, freaking out. She's like, don't yell at me. Phil always yells at me. And he's like, I was literally just talking like, hello. He said she was clearly intoxicated because as she walked in the house, she went to sit on his couch and she was so disoriented that she like missed the couch and fell on the floor. At this point, she started to get sick. She went in the bathroom and she started to like vomit, right? Because she's, there's a lot of reasons here as to why she probably was, but she's all messed up. She starts to vomit. She starts crying for him to call Phil. She's like, call my house, call Phil. I need to talk to Phil. Please call so I can talk to Phil. So he does this. He tries to call Phil. And it's at about this time that he notices that Bryn has brought a gun with her. And he's like, like, why do you have a gun? Why do you frantic woman, frantic drunk woman have a gun in my house? And he asks her like, why do you have this gun, dude? And it's at this point that she shocks him. She starts crying super duper hard. And she tells him, I killed Phil. And he asks her like, what? Like why? And she says she doesn't know. Now, when she says this, He doesn't believe her. He thinks that she's drunk. She's belligerent. There's no way that's true. He looks at the gun. He thinks all the bullets are there. And he's like, 
okay, no, she's just crazy. This definitely didn't happen. So he spends the next couple of hours taking care of her because he's actually worried that she's going to OD. So he keeps her in his house, helps her get to a sober-ish point, you know, gives her water, all that jazz. And when she's to a point that he feels like she can at least drive back to her house after a couple of hours, he's like, okay, you need to go home. You need to go home, your husband to your kids. So she gets in her car and he gets in his car and drives behind her to follow her to make sure like that she gets home over. It was during this drive that he started to get the nagging feeling that something might actually be wrong here. He felt like he didn't know what he was going into, but that it probably wasn't good and that maybe Bryn did actually do something to Phil. So he follows behind her and she's driving like a crazy person. She's swerving all over the road. She's running red lights. To be fair, she was like pretty intoxicated, Um, but he follows her. They get to the house. They get out. They walk into the home together. He follows Bryn because she walks right to her bedroom. And as soon as he gets to the door of the bedroom, he sees inside and he sees that what Bryn said was true. Phil is there lying on the bed and he can see that Phil is clearly dead and that he had been shot in the face. At that moment, Bryn falls to the ground screaming and crying. It's kind of like, like the vibe I got from that is that she had kind of convinced herself that it wasn't true, that she had somehow imagined it. But in seeing it, she knew that she had actually fucking did this. And she locks herself in the bedroom. She locks herself in. Ron's on the outside. He's like, holy fuck, what did I just see? And this is the point where he calls 911 and reports what he's found. And then Bryn, while she's in the room, she actually calls a friend of hers. And she tells this friend what she did. And I'm just like, can you imagine getting this phone call? This is what you're waking up to. It's early as hell. It's like six o'clock in the morning. And your friend's calling you in hysterics saying that she murdered her husband. Anyways, this friend and her husband immediately drive over to the house. They're not very far away. They go, Ron lets them in. So these people are in the house. Ron are in the house. And it's at this time that Bryn makes another phone call. She calls her sister and she tells her sister, like, listen, I need you to make sure that my kids know that I love them. Keep in mind, while all of this is happening, both of those kids are in this house. I believe they were nine and six at the time. I don't know if at the time they knew what was going on. I read that the son had heard the shots, but didn't know what they were because he was a child. But they wake up in this house. It's filled with people. I don't know if they know these people. They probably have seen these people. Well, why are you in my house in the morning? Police are showing up and their parents are locked in a bedroom together. So police are here at this point. They get there. They see all these people. They evacuate the home. They take everybody outside except for Bryn because she's locked herself in the room and she has a gun. So it's like a standoff situation at this point. So outside are her friends, her and Phil's friends, their kids, the police, the media. Everybody is out there hoping that there's going to be a good outcome here, that there's going to be a resolution, that they're going to find out what happened. But then they hear a shot. Police officers enter the room and they find 49-year-old Phil and 40-year-old Bryn dead in their bed. Phil had been shot three times. He was shot once in the chest, once in the neck, and once in the face. And it's believed that he was shot while he was like laying in bed trying to sleep. What people think happened is that Bryn came home. She was all messed up. They got into a fight and Phil, like he usually did, removed himself from the fight and was like, you know what? I'm just going to go to bed. Went to go to sleep and Bryn stewed in her anger before getting a gun, coming back and just shooting him while he laid there. Now, why did this happen? We'll never really know. People have thoughts, but I mean, they're both dead. So we'll never know what happened in that room. But I know it was determined that at the time that Bryn killed Phil and then killed herself, she was like heavily under the influence. She had a lot of cocaine in her system. And this right here could have been, you know, the cause of their fight. I mean, we do know that Phil had a big issue with her using cocaine and that he had threatened to leave her. So it's possible she came home. He knew she was, you know all high. And he was like, this is, you know, and that, you know, you know what I'm saying? Like that could have easily caused the fight. And speaking of the cocaine, something that I read that I was like, holy shit, like it's crazy. So apparently, I don't know if it's true, if it's alleged or it's what people thought, but it's believed that the person who gave Bryn the coke that she was on when she killed Phil was Andy Dick. And Andy Dick was at a bar and Phil's best friend, one of Phil's best friends, this was John Lovitz. I'm sure you are familiar. John Lovitz saw Andy Dick. And having no place to direct his anger at the murder of his friend, he went and he like attacked Andy Dick in this bar. He like grabbed him. He slammed his head into the bar and he blamed him for his friend being killed, which that's very sad. Like it's, it's hard when you don't have anybody to blame for what happened, which it's not okay to like attack somebody. And it's not fair to blame 
somebody who gave her the drugs for the murder taking place. But I also understand like misdirected anger. I cannot imagine losing my best friend like that. I'm not even gonna get into it because I could cry. Oh God, I'm going to. No, 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 no. no. <laughs> but it wasn't just the coke in Bryn's system. I'm just gonna work through this. It wasn't just the coke in Bryn's system. She also had a lot of alcohol in her system and she had Zoloft in her system. And a lot of people believe that the Zoloft like greatly contributed to this tragedy. Bryn's brother even ended up taking out a wrongful death suit against Bryn's doctor and actually the makers of Zoloft claiming that Zoloft, that the Zoloft in her system, which he believed she did not even need to be prescribed, altered her state of mind and caused her to do what she did. They never did go to trial because they came to a settlement of $100,000, but they, the people that were being sued, never admitted any guilt. They don't believe that Zoloft actually contributed considering Bryn did have like erratic behavior prior to being prescribed Zoloft anyway. People do believe that she wasn't in her right state of mind when she did what she did, though. Like, I mean, it could be said pretty across the board that she was probably pretty messed up with all the stuff in her system. And it's even been said that there was so much of each of these things in her system that she probably had no idea what was going on when she actually did kill Phil. Which, okay, maybe that is true. But, like, a lot of people drink. A lot of people do cocaine. A lot of people take Zoloft. And they do not do what Brent did. After Phil's death, the media went absolutely crazy, dude. Like, Phil was so, so loved, so famous at this time, and he had been murdered. And not only was he murdered, he was murdered by his wife, who then killed herself. So they went crazy. You know how the media does. But they went about it in, like, a really distasteful way. They started tarnishing Phil's name and his memory. They started kind of blaming his death on him, saying that he must have cheated on her. She must have found out that there was somebody else to cause her to do this. He must have cheated with either a woman or a man. And that he had this double life that no one knew about and basically saying that it was his fault. And it was just like, gross. <laughs> I don't know how else to say it. It's just gross. But those who knew Phil knew that all of that was bullshit. They were crushed. You know what I mean? And they knew that he was like an unreplaceable person and that the media was just being absolutely stupid just fucking stupid. They did try like to replace him in a sense, because remember he was like a famous person on a lot of shows and John Lovitz, you know, Phil's good friend, the one that smashed up Andy Dick. He actually did go on news radio and he tried to take over his best friend's role, you know, which was like a sweet thing because of the person who was trying to do it, but it was never um, successful. And the show ended up getting canceled anyway, because it just couldn't go on without Phil. Now, Phil and Bryn were both cremated and their ashes were spread together in Catalina Island. On Catalina Island? On Catalina Island. Because this is a place that Phil, like, really, really loved. It, he even had a will that said, like, when he died, that's where he wanted his ashes to be spread. Um, I can't imagine that day, like, going there and spreading their ashes and spreading their ashes together after all was said and done. I feel like that would be incredibly hard and incredibly emotional. And I truly cannot imagine it. Now, as far as Phil's legacy, Phil Hartman ended up getting a star on the Walk of Fame years after his murder. And in Canada, his homeland, so to speak, where he often visited over the years, a plaque was erected for Phil and his memory by the city of Brantford. But of course, Phil's kids were his main legacy. I, ugh, When I think of them, like my heart breaks for them to lose both of their parents this way in such a tragedy to have to not only grieve, but also have anger and resentment. And I, I can't put myself there. It's too much. Uh, I read that they went on to live with their aunt, Bryn's sister, and they mostly have stayed out of the public eye. Uh, his daughter did go on SNL's 40th anniversary, anniversary celebration to like honor her father and to be there in his name. And she said that she was just kind of blown away that her father was still like honored and loved so much after all these years. And with that, that, my friends, is the story of the heartbreaking murder of Phil Hartman. And knowing that he was such a beloved person who touched so many people's lives for so many years, do me a favor. Leave your favorite Phil Hartman line, memory, role, fact, anything positive about him down in the comments below so we can have a little bit of sunshine after such a heavy case. With that said, I hope this video was informative and made sense. And I want to thank you for remembering Phil with me today. And now I just want to revisit the question of the day. I gave it to you in the beginning, but we're going to, you know, now that we have the information, I'm going to ask you again. And it was just like, what do you think happened that night? What do you think was the tipping point that caused something so pointless and tragic to take place? Let me know all your thoughts in the comments below. 
So please gather around and let me tell you the story of the life and death of Selena Quintanilla Perez, the queen of Tejano music. So Selena Quintanilla Perez, born simply Selena Quintanilla, was born in Lake Jackson, Texas on April 16th, 1971, making her an Aries. Selena was the youngest of three children, having an older brother and an older sister, and the trio was raised by both of their parents, Abraham the Papa and Marcella the Mama, and the whole Quintanilla family was extremely close throughout all of their lives. Music was in Selena's blood. Her father was a musician who had actually dropped out of high school, even though his mother strongly disapproved, and he dropped out of high school to try to make it big as a singer. Abraham played in a band called Los Dinos for a couple of years, and the band would play shows, and they actually put out a couple of LPs before Abraham actually got drafted into the military. And so he had to put the music on hold. While on duty, this is actually when Abraham met Selena's mother, Marcella, and the two were married in 1963, while Marcella was actually pregnant with the couple's first child, a son, Abraham Jr., or I think he was Abraham III, but he went by A.B. Shortly after A.B. came the couple's first daughter, Suzette, and then shortly after that, baby Selena was born. After being discharged from the military, Abraham and his family moved to Corpus Christi, Corpus Christi, Texas. And this is where he met back up with his bandmates and they started playing shows again, but they suffered a lot of racism because of their Spanish speaking music in Texas. So even though they kind of tried to keep it going, by the time Selena was two years old, the band had completely broken up. But with a father like Abraham and a past like Abraham had, music was in the family. So naturally the kids were brought up playing music and learning music. And by the time Selena was nine years old, Abraham had started a band of his three children with A.B. on guitar, Suzette, little girl on the drums, and Selena as the lead singer. And the band was actually named Selena y Los Dinos, giving a little nod to his prior band that he had been in for all those years. And I apologize in advance if I have trouble with pronunciations. I did want to ask my husband how to pronounce things, but he's not here today, and I am hella white. Abraham managed the kids' band, naturally, and they had a little bit of trouble booking shows because there was a little bit of prejudice against Selena because Selena was singing Tejano music. And what Tejano music is, is like a fusion of a lot of different types of music. It's Mexican music, it's country music, it's jazz. It's a lot of things all enveloped under one umbrella of music. And at the time that she started her, her singing in this style of music, it was a pretty male dominated genre. But boy, would she change that in her life? Yes, she would. Because of that prejudice, the group was suffering. They would kind of take whatever shows they could. They would do birthdays, they would do weddings, they would do anything they could get, but they really started playing more shows when Abraham opened up a restaurant in 1982 called Papa Gallos. And inside the restaurant, he built a little stage in the front where the kids could play their songs for the customers while they ate their food. Unfortunately though, the recession hit and in 1983, the business actually did close and it got so bad for the Quintanillas that they actually ended up getting evicted from their home. So these random paid jobs at birthday parties and weddings ended up being like the only source of income that the family had. With Selena and the band playing these shows, the popularity for Selena in particular started to rise and Abraham saw that and he recognized her talent and her drive and that she had something special. So he actually took Selena out of school so that she could focus on music full time. And Selena loved this. She was all about music, but she didn't let her education go to waste. And she ended up doing kind of like homeschool when she could and still ended up graduating and getting her diploma at 17, then went on to continue and do some college. Like education was very important to Selena. I saw many interviews with her and she was always talking about the importance of education and pushing how, how vital that was to her. And how vital it should be to people in general. She had said that music and money will come and go, but education is something that is forever. And I thought that that was very sweet. So we're going to fast forward a little bit to the mid 1980s, where after all the hard work and all the grinding with Selena and her brother and her sister and Abraham, the band finally had a little break and they recorded their very first album. And it was a fully Spanish album. And Selena initially wanted to sing in English. It was her primary language. It was what she was more comfortable with. But Abraham had an inkling that she would do better and be more successful if she sang Tejano music. And boy, was he right. A little less than two years after Selena y Los Dinos recorded their first album in 1987, Selena won Best Female Vocalist at the Tejano Music Festival at just 15 years old. She was doing so good. Can you imagine? I cannot. I'm trying to imagine having that kind of like success so young. It blows my mind. 
So just two years after this, in 1989, Selena was performing at the Tejano Music Awards when a producer for EMI Latin Records saw Selena's performance and wanted to sign her right away. He had said in an interview that he was just captivated by her voice, that it was one of the most beautiful voices he had ever heard, that Selena could convey emotion that was well beyond her young years, and he described her as having a teardrop on her vocal cords. That same year, Selena recorded and released her first album with her brand new record label, and it was titled simply Selena, but it would not be her last. In 1990, Selena's album Ven Conmigo was released, and it ended up being the first ever Tejano album written by a female artist to win the Golds. And from there, her career skyrocketed. She was so popular after this that Coca-Cola, Coca-Cola, asked her if she would be a spokesperson. And she agreed, and she was a spokesperson for Coca-Cola. One of the biggest brands in the world, right? Or at least, I think so? Probably? Maybe. During the same year, the band would hire a new member, a man named Chris Perez, who would play guitar for the band and would later, despite the strong disapproval of Abraham, become Selena's husband. Abraham was not a fan of Chris. He thought that Chris was, you know, a little bit of a bad boy, a little rough around the edges, and he thought that Chris would be... He thought that Chris would ruin Selena's image, essentially. He even went so far as to try to break them up by firing Chris from the band, but Selena was like, no, 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 Gypsy. And she and Chris actually went out and eloped and then hid it from her father, but he did quickly find out, and after a little bit of time, he did welcome Chris back into the band and also into the family. Things were going super well for Selena. She had become a household name. She was getting brand deals. She had met the love of her life and gotten married. It was a real started from the bottom, now we're here type of energy, right? And, you know, things were just going so, so well for her, but unfortunately this would quickly change when Selena met a 30-year-old woman named Yolanda Saldivar, who would later end Selena's life. So, Yolanda. Let's talk about Yolanda a bit, shall we? Apparently Yolanda first discovered Selena when she went to one of her concerts with, I believe, her niece. And after seeing Selena play, Yolanda was just completely enamored with her and her look and her vibrancy and this just like ball of Aries energy that Selena was. So Yolanda started calling Abraham all the time. She must have called him at least a dozen times because here's what happened. She realized that she wanted to buy some Selena merch and there wasn't really much Selena merch on the market. So she called Abraham and was like, hey, I would like to start a Selena fan club with your permission. Um, and I'd like to do it in the state of Texas. Selena and Yolanda's home state. Basically what a celebrity fan club is or what it was, I don't think they're a thing anymore, but um, if you're too young to remember, is essentially like there's a celebrity, Selena, and you pay a certain amount of dollars and then you have access to like specific merch and dates when Selena's gonna do meets and greets, things like that. So Abraham agreed. He didn't think there would be any problem. He saw Yolanda as just a young woman, a registered nurse, someone whose job it was to protect people. So he trusted that. Well, the fan club came to fruition with Yolanda as the club's president and it quickly gained thousands of members. Shortly after the start of the fan club, Selena and Yolanda finally met and the two instantly became close. Selena was just that type of person. She was very loving and accepting and friendly with all of her fans. Anytime she met them, she wanted them to feel warm and happy and like they were hanging out with a friend and Yolanda was helping her family. She was running this fan club for free. She wasn't making any money. So Selena was just incredibly grateful to her. So Yolanda and Selena became very close. And after Yolanda accompanied Selena on like a trip to film a music video, the two got so close that Selena then offered her a paid job as her personal assistant, to which Yolanda happily agreed. It was at this point after becoming her assistant that Yolanda became especially protective of Selena to the point of obsession. It got to the point that no one could even talk to Selena without going through Yolanda first. Now, this might seem like normal assistant stuff because I've, I've been an assistant and that is kind of what you do. You're the in-between person. But, but what wasn't normal was the amount of pictures of Selena that Yolanda had covering the walls of her home. All right, so Yolanda is now Selena's personal assistant and Selena is just living her best life. And in 1992, Selena released yet another album called Entre a Mi Mundo, 
and her career just shot up, soaring into space. She's just killing it. This record was number one on the U.S. Billboard Regional Mexican Album for eight straight months and was certified 10 times platinum. And this album was the first Tejano album sang by a female singer to sell over 300,000 copies. So the album did very well. Selena followed up the success of that album with yet another album. This was a live album that actually won her her first and only Grammy that she would get in her career. And it was for best Mexican American album at the age of 23, 23 years old. She was a machine man, right? So she had just won a Grammy and she decided at this point she wanted to kind of diversify her portfolio of business ventures. So she decided that she wanted to break into fashion. With that said, she launched her very own clothing line with clothing that she herself helped design. And this seemed like such a next step for Selena. If you've ever seen Selena, you know that she was kind of a fashion icon. There's so many outfits that if you were to see them, you know, oh, that's a Selena outfit. She, she was that beach, you know? Selena followed up on this idea and she ended up opening two boutiques, both in her home state of Texas called Selena, etc. And these were really cool boutiques actually, because they weren't just normal clothing stores. This was a place that you could go and it was a clothing store and also a beauty salon. So you could go in, pick out your outfit and then lay down, get your hair washed, get your makeup done, get it all done in one place. Which I don't know if things like that exist. I don't think they're in my uh, pay grade, but if they do, that's really cool. With opening these new boutiques, uh, naturally they needed to be managed. So considering that her fan club was doing so well and that Yolanda and her had become so close, she'd proven her loyalty to both Selena, the business and the family, they decided to hire Yolanda to run both of the boutiques. I feel like I have illustrated just how successful Selena was, but let me, uh, let me tell you a couple more of her achievements here. After opening both of her shops, Selena recorded and released yet another album in 1994 called Amor Prohibido, and this was actually regarded as one of her best works. In addition to releasing her best album, Selena had decided that she wanted to expand her boutiques to not only be in Texas, but to also be in Mexico as well. And she had then started recording her first ever English speaking album called Dreaming of You. But unfortunately, Selena would not be alive to see the album's release and its subsequent success. While all of this great stuff is happening for Selena, it comes to light to Abraham that the boutiques are hemorrhaging money. In addition to that, Abraham starts to get complaints from members of the Selena fan club saying that they had paid their membership and had not been receiving the items that they had paid for and had been promised. So he starts looking in to the finances and the books and he realizes that both the fan club and the boutiques are hemorrhaging money. And what is the common factor here? Yolanda. Abraham then calls a meeting with him, Yolanda and Selena, and he sits her down and he's like, look, this is what I'm seeing, shows her all the proof, lets her know about all what the fans are saying, what he's seen, everything. And of course, she denies it. She doesn't even really have any answers for his questions and she can't really explain where this money is, even though she's in charge of it. So he tells her, listen, if you do not get me proof that it's not you stealing this, I'm going to call the police. Abraham wanted to fire her immediately, but Selena was reluctant. She had become friends with her. She was surprised that her friend could hurt her like this and screw her over essentially. But the family decided that she needed at least until she came up with proof to be taken off the finances, right? Because they were worried that if they fired her, that she would freak out and she would like rob them of all of their money. They were half right about, you know, her being unstable and her going crazy and robbing them. But instead of robbing them, she went crazy when cut off from the money and she bought a gun. At this point, Selena is trying to be very delicate with Yolanda because Yolanda had a lot of important paperwork regarding like the finances of Selena's boutiques because she had been managing them and she needed to kind of like be careful so that she could get that information back from Yolanda. Yolanda agreed to give Selena back all of her documents, but just wanted Selena to meet her in person so they could talk when it happened face to face. So on March 30th, 1995, Yolanda checked into the Days Inn Motel in Corpus Christi, Texas. When she got there, she called Selena and was like, hey, I'm here. So Selena drove over with her husband to pick up the documents. And this was at night. 
when they get there, Selena went in by herself. And when she got there, she told Yolanda like, oh, Chris is waiting in the car. So she was inside for a little bit. I'm not really sure what was said, but she came out, she got in the car and the two started to head back home with the paperwork on the drive. Selena started to kind of look through the paperwork and realize oh, she didn't give me everything. Why is she doing this? Right. And she wanted to go back right then, but Chris was like, you know, it's late. We're already headed home. Just forget about it. So Selena decided mentally without mentioning to Chris that the next day she would go over and get the remaining paperwork. As Selena left the house the following morning, her husband, Chris, did not know where she was going. He's later said that if he did, he would have gone with her, but she didn't mention it and he didn't think to ask. So he watched his wife leave that morning, having no idea that that would be the last time he would ever see her. It's March 31st, 1995, and Selena is probably annoyed, right? She had been trying to get this paperwork from Yolanda and Yolanda had been giving her the runaround. So she had decided that enough was enough. The friendship was over. The business relationship was over. She just needed her paperwork back and to completely cut ties with Yolanda. When she arrived at Yolanda's hotel room that morning, Yolanda had said that she needed to go to the hospital. Apparently Yolanda had been claiming that on a trip to Mexico, she had been sexually assaulted and was having complications and bleeding from it. So Selena, the sweet woman that she was actually drove Yolanda to the hospital, right? So they get there and they examine her and they let them leave. The doctors later saying that they didn't really believe Yolanda's story and didn't really believe that anything had happened. So the two get back to the hotel room. When they got back to the hotel room, a fight broke out. It was probably just pent up aggression, pent up frustration. Selena had been, you know, trying to be delicate with Yolanda and take it easy and make sure that she was comfortable so that she could get her stuff back. But it was kind of, you know, enough's enough. And explosion. And it, apparently it got so loud that neighboring tenants, hotel guests complained to the front desk that there was a lot of screaming coming out of Yolanda's room. Selena had had enough and she decided she was going to leave. So she opened Yolanda's hotel room door. And this is when Yolanda shot her once in the back, calling her a bitch after shooting her. Selena started to run. She took off running across like a big grassy area headed for the lobby, just trying to get help. But when Selena was shot, she was shot in the back and it exited the front of her body. And in passing through her body, it hit one of her arteries and she was just bleeding out. So Selena did make it to the lobby. She made it inside and she collapsed on the floor, just covered in blood. And the staff there did try to help her. They put pressure on her wounds. He kept talking to her, trying to get her to stay awake. And they called the police. They did everything they could, but she was just bleeding. She was just bleeding far too much. And just before noon on March 31st, 1995, Selena died on the floor of that lobby at 23 years old. And the last words that left Selena's mouth were Yolanda 158 and 158 was her room number. The doctors did everything they could to try to save Selena once she arrived at the hospital, even though she was dead on arrival, they even tried to perform surgery on her, but it was no use. She was already gone. And in doing Selena's autopsy, it was found that if the bullet had just been a smidge higher or a smidge lower, real technical doctor term smidge, but either way, if it had been just a little higher or a little lower, she likely would have lived. So while all this is happening, when Selena first ran off, Yolanda had grabbed all of her items from the hotel room, had gotten to her truck and had started circling the parking lot looking for Selena. But when she realized that she couldn't find her and that she was already like in the lobby getting help, she tried to run. But unfortunately for her and fortunate for everyone else, she was blocked in by the police because apparently the officer who had heard the report over, you know, police scanner had just been like a block away from the motel. So he hurried over, he stood in front of Yolanda's truck and was like, freeze, get out of the truck. But she was like, no, I'm not going to do that. And she turned and she parked in a parking spot in the motel parking lot and put the gun to her head. And then began the famous standoff between Yolanda Saldivar and police. She sat in her truck for nearly 10 hours, gun to her head, crying hysterically, threatening to kill herself. So Yolanda ends up being surrounded by SWAT and they brought in a hostage hostage negotiator and they were able to make it so that there was like a phone inside of her truck and they were speaking to her and she was just hysterical. She was crying and asking how Selena was and said that she didn't mean to do it and couldn't believe what she had done to her best friend. All the time that she's in her truck, she's got the radio on listening to news to find out how Selena was doing. 
Because, you know, the last time Yolanda had seen Selena, she was injured and she was running, but she was still alive. She didn't know that Selena had died. During the 10 hour standoff, you know, Yolanda crying and screaming because she accidentally shot her best friend. Well, um, because of how long it took and how popular Selena was, there were just a bunch of fans surrounding the parking lot watching the standoff between Yolanda and police. Eventually though, the standoff ended rather, you know, anticlimactically with Yolanda just getting out of the van, getting thrown to the ground and being arrested. So news of Selena's death spread across the media like wildfire and people were devastated that Selena was so loved. Okay. That, okay. Her family did like a public viewing of Selena's body in the casket so that her fans could come and pay their respects and say goodbye to the young, the young star who had passed too soon. And thousands and thousands of people showed up like 30,000 people showed up and lined up down, down the street, just down the block for like a mile to say goodbye to Selena. Following this public viewing, there was a more close, intimate, smaller funeral for Selena, but even for the small, intimate, personal funeral, there were still 600 people present. And at her funeral, everybody lined up and placed a long stem white rose onto Selena's casket before it was lowered into the ground because that was her favorite flower. While all of this is happening, Yolanda's in jail, right? And even though this trial wasn't like um, broadcast over the news where with like the OJ Simpson trial, you could watch the whole trial as it took place, people were still heavily invested surrounding the courthouse every day to try to get a glimpse of what was happening inside. Yolanda, despite all that we know, had the audacity to plead not guilty. She said it was an accident. Her shooting Selena in the back was an accident. Since there was no one in the hotel room with Selena and Yolanda when it happened, the prosecution had to sort of prove that it wasn't an accident based on Yolanda's actions after the shooting. The prosecution essentially said that the accident theory couldn't be true because instead of helping Selena, calling the police or using her nursing skills to aid Selena after accidentally shooting her, she called her a bitch and then tried to run. Not something someone who accidentally shoots somebody typically does. And witnesses who were at the hotel, like other guests, did corroborate that Yolanda did call her a bitch. So the jury deliberated for only two hours before coming back and giving the verdict of guilty. And 34 year old Yolanda Saldivar was given life in prison with the possibility of parole in March of 2025. Five years, dude, five years from right now, that woman will be up for parole. No, 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 no. I don't think she'll get out though, to be honest. But anyways, when the guilty verdict was read, people celebrated in the streets because the most hated woman in the world had been, you know, given life in prison. And that my friends is the story of Selena Quintanilla Perez, her life as much as I could condense in a short video and her tragic death. Selena was such an incredibly important person to so many people. She was so loved because of the person she was. She had a warm heart and a bright smile, and she was just a hero because of the legacy she left behind, the empire she left behind. Well, not a hero, a legend, because heroes get remembered and legends never die. And Selena's legacy continued and still continues to this day from the movie Selena being released right after her death to her birthday, April 16th, being declared National Selena Day in her state of Texas, to the thousands and thousands of fans who show up at her grave all of the time to pay respects to her, to her album, Dreaming of You, that had not been released um, before she died. It was released three months after she died and it just like skyrocketed. In 2017, Selena got her own star on the Hollywood Walk of Fame. That same year, Matt Cosmetics released a collection, a Selena collection in this iconic purple packaging because it was Selena's favorite color. And each year there is an annual music festival in Selena's hometown of Corpus Christi, Texas to honor her. And, and Netflix is supposed to be releasing a special called Selena the Series where we will learn more about Selena's early life and her childhood because I believe they're teamed up with their parents. And that is supposed to air, I believe, December 4th. So literally in just a few days. But I did read an article the other day that has me wondering if it's still going to come out because apparently the guy who wrote the movie Selena is claiming that he has the rights to Selena's life story so that 
the series shouldn't be able to be made. If there's any updates on that, I'll put it in the description box. But the last I heard is that he's kind of suing Selena's family and Netflix for doing this series. So I don't know, but hopefully not. I hope it still happens because I would love to see it because obviously I'm very interested in Selena and her story. It's just such a sad story, you know, to have that dynamic young woman's life cut so short. 23 is so young and it's pointless. Like for what reason? I don't know what the reason is. Yolanda's changed her story so many times, man. I think that she was just an obsessed stalker because, you know, to be a stalker, a stalker isn't necessarily a stranger. A stalker can be somebody who's in your life and still stalks you. You know what I mean? And her mind was just so delusional. In, a, in an interview later, this woman, okay, this crazy woman, she said that the day of the shooting, Selena actually didn't fire her. She said that Selena came over and she told Selena that she quit. And Selena just devastated, dropped to the ground and grabbed her and hugged her feet and begged her not to go. And the only reason that she could get, the only way that she could get Selena to like get up and get off of her was to put a gun to her own head and threaten to kill herself if Selena didn't leave the room. Okay, that's just some bat shit crazy stuff, right? <laughs> but I don't know, man, what do you think? Why do you think that she killed Selena? Do you think that it was just that she snapped or do you think it was planned since she actually went out and bought the gun? I'm always really curious about your guys' opinions and where do you think Selena would be now, you know, if she had lived? Like, where would she be in her life and where would she be in her career? It makes me sad. I feel so bad for her family and for her husband. Oh my God. This case is on the murder of 10 year old Judith Barcy and her mother, Maria Barcy at the hands of Joseph Barcy, her father. So Judith Barcy was born June 6, 1978, which makes her a Gemini. And she was born to parents, Maria Barcy and Joseph Barcy. Both Maria and Joseph were Hungarian immigrants who had both fled to the US separately and just happened to meet once here um, at a restaurant in Los Angeles where um, Maria just happened to work as a waitress and Joseph the patron. Joseph would often come into the restaurant and he'd sit at the bar ordering drinks. He had a little bit of a drinking issue, um, but at that time, it, didn't, you know, set any alarms off to Maria. Obviously, um, he'd come in, sit at the bar, order his drinks, and he'd always pay in a hundred dollar bill. And over the time of, you know, him going to the restaurant and her working at the restaurant, the two got to know each other and took a liking to one another. So after a while, the two married and had one and only child. And that is our, one of our main subjects today, the main subject today, Judith Barcy. Though family members warn Maria of the rareness of actually being able to make it in Hollywood, she pushed forward. She was convinced that Judith had something special that was worth sharing um, with the world. And she started prepping Judith for her place in stardom from a very young age. Judith was first discovered at the age of five and a half years old while she was at a ice skating rink with her mother, Maria. And this was an ice skating rink that was located in the San Bernardo Valley, which is where I live, incidentally. At the time that she was discovered, Judith was a very petite child. Um, at five and a half years old, she could easily play the roles of a three-year-old, um, but have the mental capacity and the ability um, to reason of an older child. So that um, obviously helped her in her work, because that is more common in Hollywood for them to use somebody older to play somebody younger. And with that, she landed herself a job in a juice commercial. And from that point on, her career started to take off. Judith's mother did the best she could to ensure that uh, her daughter was able to have a normal childhood despite her blossoming career. She encouraged her to play games and to go outside and ride her bike. She taught her how to knit. She was just trying to help make sure that despite her career growing, she was still able to be a kid. And Maria was really excited for her daughter, man. Like she would celebrate all of her achievements whenever they'd be at home. And one of her programs was gonna be on TV. She would pop popcorn and the two would snuggle in front of the TV and watch it. She was just really proud of her child and all that her child was doing. Judith made her film debut in 1987, playing the role of Thea in Jaws 5, The Revenge. But prior to being um, featured in movies, she was featured in at least 70 commercials and several TV shows. One of the television shows that Judith appeared in was a TV miniseries called Fatal Vision. And in the show, creepily enough, Judith played a little girl who was murdered by her father. And this show aired in 1984, which was four years before life would imitate art with Judith herself 
actually being murdered by her father. So while Maria was very happy for Judith and all of her success, making sure to celebrate every one of Judith's achievements, Joseph was not as happy for his daughter. Already a struggling alcoholic um, with a bad temper, the more successful that Judith got, the more resentful that Joseph got of both Judith and by extension, Maria. The abuse started as mostly verbal, but as these things do, and as we've discussed in previous cases, um, with abuse, abuse escalates, and that was that happened in this case as well. Over the years, the abuse escalated from only verbal to also physical abuse. First, the threats, Joseph threatening to kill both Judith and Maria if they were ever to leave him, threats for him to kill just Judith and himself to leave Maria alone to suffer. It had been said by a family member that Joseph had even gone so far as to pull a knife on young Judith and tell her he would cut her throat if she decided not to come back home. And this is when she was just about to leave um, to go do, to go film her part in the movie Jaws 5. Um, and as his, ten, his young daughter's leaving, he tells her, cut your throat if you choose to not come back. While she was away on this trip, she spoke to her father on the phone and he said to her, don't forget what I told you. At which point she hung up the phone and she cried. So as I'm sure you can imagine, um, Maria and Joseph's relationship wasn't functional and it quickly started to deteriorate due to Joseph's drinking and Maria's inability to forgive that drinking and the abuse that came along with it. Many people in Judith and Maria's lives had heard about threats either from the two of them or from Joseph himself, um, and they did attempt to help. Judith's um, acting agent even suggested to Maria that Judith be taken to a child psychologist, um, and Maria did actually take her to one. Judith's agent also um, took it upon herself to even call CPS on the family, and in doing this, um, Ju uh, Maria was actually starting to make a plan with CPS to get out of the situation and to leave Joseph. She was planning to get a divorce. She wanted to get away. She had even gone so far as to get an apartment um, for her and Judith in Panorama City. She got this apartment in 1988 and um, she would spend her days there while Joseph was at work and then come home at night. But Maria never officially left. She never moved out. As is common in relationships that are ending and especially in abusive relationships, Maria had a lot of trouble leaving, and she made a lot of excuses to stay, a lot of reasons to stay. She didn't want to leave her home. She didn't want to leave all her nice things. She didn't want a chance ruining a career that she had spent so much time and effort building for her daughter, things like that. But Judith's home life was taking a toll on her mentally, physically, emotionally. The once bubbly, sweet, and happy little girl with her bright eyes and her giant smile was falling apart right in front of people's eyes. In the months leading up to her death, she had started to change physically, she had started to gain weight, and she had plucked out all of her eyelashes from the stress of her home life. So the Friday before the murders, um, Maria had been talking to a neighbor, and the neighbor recalls that Maria seemed more stressed about Joseph than usual. She said that Maria said that she wanted to leave, but she was scared because Joseph had again threatened to kill them and had threatened to burn the house down. So on June 25th, 1988, Judith had had an audition scheduled for a TV series. And when Judith did not arrive at her audition, her agent called the house where she spoke to Joseph. Um, that was when Joseph informed the agent that a car had came and picked up Maria and Judith that morning and had been headed to San Diego. Um, but unfortunately, that was not the case. Instead, in the early morning hours of that day, 55-year-old Joseph had gone into his daughter's room and walked up to his 10 year old daughter while she was in her bed and shot her once killing her instantly her mother hearing the sound ran to her daughter's room where she was met with joseph in the hallway he then 
shot his 48 year old wife as she dropped to the ground and put her hands above her head and killed her as well. And what's, what's weird is after the fact, Joseph stayed in the house for two days with the bodies unmoved until Wednesday, the 27th. He just hung out in the house with the bodies of his family. And then on that Wednesday morning, July 27th at around 8.30 a.m., gunshots again rang from the house and smoke poured from the windows. Joseph had poured lighter fluid on both Judith and Maria's bodies before setting fire to their West Hills home. He then went down to his garage where he shot and killed himself. The gun was found in Joseph's hand and a gas can was found a few feet from his body. What caused the uh, final attack from Joseph is unknown. Maybe he found out that Maria was planning to get a divorce. Maybe he found out about the apartment. Um, maybe he had found out about there was a tax refund check that I guess had been made out to Judith that Maria was hiding and planning to cash herself without telling Joseph. Who knows? All we know for sure is that Joseph Barsi murdered his 10 year old daughter and his wife in cold blood and then took himself out like the coward that he was. And I'm not saying that everyone who kills themselves is a coward. That's not what I'm saying. I'm saying this guy, this piece of shit who murdered his wife and 10 year old daughter is a coward in my opinion. Judith and her mother were buried together in a cemetery in Hollywood Hills in unmarked graves until um, public donations equaled enough for them to have headstones put where they were buried, which is kind of strange because I know that at least Maria had a family. There was interviews from her brother, but maybe they didn't have enough money. I'm not sure, but they laid with unmarked graves for many years before the public donated enough for them to be able to get their headstones. During Judith's funeral, um, a poem was read titled A Child of Mine, and it's so, it's so sad. I'm going to read you a little part of it um, right now. But should the angels call to her much sooner than we've planned, we'll brave the bitter grief that comes and try to understand. And that is just the horrible story of the murders of 10-year-old Judith Barcy and her mother, Maria. Come gather around and let me tell you the story of the murder of Marvin Gaye. The Prince of Soul. On April 1st, 1984, police responded to a call that led them to a home in Los Angeles, California. When they arrived at this home, they found that a man, this was 69-year-old Marvin Gaye Sr., was sitting calmly on the front porch. But once they entered the home and they went into one of the bedrooms of the house, they found that this man's son, 44-year-old Marvin Gaye Jr., was suffering from gunshot wounds. And so he was rushed to the hospital, obviously, because they were hoping that they'd be able to save his life. But unfortunately, he was pronounced dead on arrival. Marvin Gaye had been shot twice, and the first bullet had been fatal. Because of the position that Marvin was in when he was shot, the first bullet had pierced his left kidney, his stomach, his liver, his lung, and his heart. And then the second bullet that entered him just went through his shoulder. When the news first started coming out that Marvin Gaye had been killed, at first, people actually didn't believe it. They thought that it was a joke. They thought it was a hoax because it was April 1st, April Fool's Day after all. But as more and more reports started coming out, and it started coming out that Marvin Gaye Jr. was murdered and that his father, Marvin Gaye Sr., was responsible, people started to realize that it was true. The Prince of Soul was dead and his father had murdered him. Now, let's talk about Marvin a little bit and his father so we can understand how we ended up at this place. Marvin Pence Gay Jr., who was actually born... Okay, so his name, Marvin Gay, spelled like this. I'm going to put it on the screen. He actually was born Marvin Gay with no E at the end of his name, but when he went into performing later, he changed his stage name to Marvin Gay with an E, which we'll get into a little bit more later, but I just wanted to clarify that now. Um, but Marvin Pence Gay Jr. was born on April 2nd, 1939, and he was born in Washington, D.C. to his parents, Alberta, who was a social worker and a maid, and his father, Marvin Gay Sr., who was a preacher. Marvin was the second of four children born to his parents. He had an older sister, and then he had a younger sister and a younger brother. 
Marvin also had an older brother who Alberta, his mother, had actually given birth to shortly before she met and married Marvin Sr. in 1935, which this is so messed up. But when Alberta and Marvin Sr. got married, Marvin Sr. told her, like, listen, I'm not going to raise some other man's child. So he actually had Alberta's first child, which is the oldest son, Marvin's oldest brother, sent to live with family. And that's where he grew up. And you know what, speaking of other children who are out there that are related to Marvin Gaye, um, (laughs) Alberta wasn't the only person who had a child, like, out of their relationship. Marvin Sr. had a son as well, but this son actually was conceived while he was married to Alberta because he was not faithful. Apparently he was, like, known for being very unfaithful all the time, having numerous affairs. So there could be even more kids out there, but there was one son that was claimed, that was known to be his, that was born to another woman while he was married to Alberta. So lots of kids. We already have some tension with him, you know, sending her oldest son away and then going out and having affairs and getting other people pregnant. And this is the home that Marvin Gaye is being born into. Now, this was already like a pretty large household, right? With four children to raise. That would already seem like a lot. But this family seemed even larger when you took into the fact that Marvin Sr. in Alberta just simply did not have the financial means to raise all of these children. Marvin Gaye and his siblings grew up in a very low income house, like so low income that they didn't have electricity or running water at times. But, you know, you hear about people all the time that come from homes that don't have a lot of money, don't have, I mean, you don't hear as many, at least I don't hear, well, I know, Hmm, how do I word this properly? A lot of people grow up without money, right? A lot of us grow up poor. I grew up hella poor. But a lot of times these families have each other to lean on. Our love will keep us warm. We can do anything as long as we weather this storm together, right? Like you hear about that a lot. But that just really wasn't the case in Marvin Gaye's household. Now, as I said before, Marvin Gaye's father was a preacher. And I'm now going to expand on that a little bit because it does matter. So he was a preacher at a Hebrew Pentecostal church called the House of God. And he had been a part of this church and belief system for a very long time. Now, I'm not going to get into the whole belief system of the Pentecostal faith, but it is a bit more strict than like traditional Christianity. Like, for example, particularly with women, women are to wear like long dresses that go all the way down to their ankles and long sleeves that go down to their wrists. Um, You're not supposed to watch TV. You're not supposed to listen to the radio. Girls are not square open-toed shoes or makeup, things like that. Now, I know for a fact there are people out there that are going to know way more about the intricate specifics of the Pentecostal faith, but I'm not completely talking out of my ass because I did have a little bit of introduction to this in my life. I had an uncle and aunt and cousins who were Pentecostal, and the conversation definitely came up. Like, I got to hear a little bit here, a little bit there, when we'd have family gatherings. Like, me and my sisters were allowed to watch cartoons, and my cousins were not. But, like, that's as much as I really know. Um, so, if you are Pentecostal yourself, you're honestly probably not watching this video. But if you have more information on that and you want to put it in the comment section so we can all learn, feel free to do so. Anyways, in addition to, you know, no TV, girls wearing long sleeves, there was another thing... Um, in the belief system that Marvin Gaye Sr. held, and that was that his wife's role was to be a supporter of the leader of the household. And that was the husband, that was Marvin Gaye Sr., and his children were to be obedient. This was what he believed, this was the belief system he had, and he said that his family, his wife, his kids needed to follow that. And when they did not, when his kids, when his wife failed to live up to the expectations he had, were not obedient to him, they were subjected to abuse, both physical abuse and verbal abuse. So, okay, for example, Marvin Sr., Papa Marvin, raised his kids so deep in their religion, like they were observing extended Sabbath on Saturdays and all that jazz, and he would actually go as far as quizzing his kids on biblical passages. And if they got the questions wrong, he would beat his kids. He would even starve his kids because he believed that the hunger would bring them closer to God. Marvin Gaye later said of his father, and I quote, Living with a father was like living with a king, an all-cruel, changeable, cruel, and all-powerful king. Now, even though Alberta and all of the kids received, you know, their fair share of abuse, nobody received quite as much as Marvin Jr. Like, for whatever reason, Marvin Sr. really just did not care for him. And even Marvin's sister said that Marvin Jr. really received, like, 
the bulk of his rage and got the worst weapons. Apparently, Marvin Sr. often told his son, like, I brought you into this world, and if you cross me, I will take you out. He just didn't like his eldest son. Like, for whatever reason, he didn't like his eldest son, the child that was literally named after him. Alberta has come out since and said, like, he never wanted Marvin. He never even liked Marvin. And for some reason, she doesn't know why, he never even loved his child. She said what made the situation worse is that he didn't want her to love Marvin. He didn't want her to love her own son, but she did. She loved him so much. Apparently her and Marvin Jr. had a super, super close relationship, which probably, you know, didn't make Papa Gay very happy since he was so vocal and open about disliking his son. Alberta said that throughout Marvin's life, uh, Marvin Sr. would just say like, he knew Marvin wasn't his kid. He would deny him, say that he wasn't his son. And Alberta would tell him like that was nonsense. And she knew that deep down, he knew that it was his child. He just didn't love him for some reason. And she said, and this is really sad. She said that from a young age, when Marvin Gaye was just a little boy, he knew his father didn't love him. Like, okay, Marvin Sr. was asked after Marvin Gaye died, after he had murdered his child, they asked him like, did you ever love your son? And he answered with, Let's say I didn't dislike him. That's so sad to me, dude. Now, when Marvin was little, his father played piano at church. And even though Marvin Jr., you know, feared his father and didn't like him very much, he did still seem like he wanted his approval. He wanted him to, he wanted to please him. So when his father would play piano, he actually started going to the church. Well, he had already gone to the church, but he started singing choir in the church. And that's actually where his love of music began. He would sing, his father would play piano, and eventually he actually taught himself to play piano as well. It was during this time that people really started to take notice of Marvin and how good of a singer he was. He was very well known at that time in the area for being great, and people just saw him as like a natural talent. But as his skills, his natural abilities became more and more apparent, his father like refused to see it, refused to acknowledge it, and refused to support it. But his mother did. His mother was incredibly supportive of his musical career. And Marvin came out later when he was an adult. He said, like, if his mother had not been there to support him in his journey through music, he may have taken his own life. And that probably has to do with the fact that his father told him over and over, like, you're never going to be anything. You're never going to amount to anything. This was his passion, his escape from a less than ideal home. And as he grew up, it didn't get any better. His home life just didn't get better. In his teenage years, the abuse got so bad that he would just not come home. He'd stay with friends for days at a time just to avoid his father. And then this would make his father even more mad. So when he did come home, it was just not a good experience. By 1956, Marvin Jr. was almost done with high school. He was like in his final years of high school and he actually decided to drop out because he wanted to join in the Air Force. I guess his home life was so bad, he finally just had enough of it and he just wanted to get as far away as possible. And by this time, his father had actually left the church. He had kind of lost his faith, lost his faith in the church and God and kind of in people just across the board. And he had actually um, turned to alcohol really aggressively. He couldn't hold down a job, was just always drinking and leaving all of the financial burden and responsibility on his wife's shoulders. And this was incredibly hard for her. So that's another reason that Marvin Jr. decided to leave. One, he wanted to get away. And two, he wanted to go and make something of himself. So he had some money so he could help his mother support herself, you know, and her husband. And this did work, by the way, later down the line, obviously not immediately upon leaving and going into the Air Force. But once he like made it in music, he did make enough to fulfill his dream of helping his mother. He bought his parents a, like a big ass house in Los Angeles. And his mother was able to actually retire and just live there and be cool and be comfortable. So he got to do what he wanted to do, which is not something that all of us can do. Now, when he first joined the air force, he wanted to be a pilot, but it didn't take him long to realize that this wasn't really for him. I have to imagine that it honestly, it probably reminded him too much of his father, like being screamed at and controlled really wasn't doing it for him like he thought it might. So he actually faked a mental illness so that he could be discharged from the Air Force. It was once returning home after being honorably discharged that Marvin Gaye really started to make his way and go down the path of music as a career. 
He ended up joining a vocal group and started getting work as a backup singer and a backup musician um, throughout the years, but didn't really find his own break for a while. But, you know, he had to put in his dues first. Eventually, though, he ended up getting a break when he signed with Tamla Motown, which was a record label founded by Barry Gordy. And this was huge because other artists who were attached to this label at the time were just some people that maybe you've heard of, maybe you haven't. It was like um, the Supremes. And this is when Diana Ross was still included, Stevie Wonder, the Jackson 5, Smokey Robinson, you know, Ryan Howard's all-time favorite musician, and now Marvin Gaye. It was around this time that Marvin Gaye added the E to the end of his last name, changing it from G-A-Y to G-A-Y-E. And he did this for a couple of reasons. The first of which was that, you know, he wanted to separate himself from his father and, you know, be his own person, all that, which totally makes sense considering the upbringing he had. And also, just wanting to be your own person. I get it. But the other reason was that he wanted to make sure that nobody had any questions about his sexuality because before that it had been just gay, which is like, I don't know, man, it was such a different time. People, I don't know. It may have been something I wouldn't have done, but apparently he had some insecurities around this already because something about Marvin Gaye Sr. that is discussed a lot. People talk about it a lot. And it was something that made Marvin Gaye Jr. a little bit insecure was that his father was said like across the board in all articles, he was referred to as a cross-dresser. Them saying they liked to, that he liked to cross-dress, which is a term that just hits my ear wrong. I like Googled it to see. I was like, is this the term? Because it makes me uncomfortable for whatever reason. It just hits wrong. I don't know if it's offensive online. It says it's not, but let me know because I know you guys will. You guys are pretty good about that. Is there a term that is more widely accepted? Because for whatever reason, when I say it, I feel ick. And when I read it, I was like, that feels ick. But either way, Marvin Sr. would, you know, cross-dress, and he had features that were seen as more femme, and he liked to accentuate that, and he liked to dress that way behind closed doors. And this is something that Marvin Jr. saw growing up and even adopted growing up. He and his father would both do this, and he said he wanted to make it clear that he and his father were not gay. They just liked to explore and express the feminine parts of themselves through dress from time to time. But then at the same time, he did change his name because he wanted to make sure everybody knew he was straight as hell, Marvin Gaye with an E. Now, the next several years were a whirlwind of upward momentum for Marvin Gaye and his career and like his life. It changed so much so fast. His career was taking off with him having several popular songs, both as a solo artist and in duos. Today, Marvin Gaye is widely known as one of the most successful soul musicians of all time. He helps to quote, shape the sound of the Motown in the 1960s, earning him the nickname, well, two nicknames, the Prince of Motown and the Prince of Soul. On top of having success in his career, he was also having a little bit of success in his love life because he had met and married his first wife. This was a woman named Anna Gordy. Now you may recognize that last name Gordy because this was actually the sister of Barry Gordy, who was the founder of Motown, the label that he was attached to. So Anna was a bit older than Marvin when they met, but they really hit it off and they really liked each other. They dated, they got married, they were happy. They even went on to adopt a baby together, this little baby boy. I guess Anna's cousin, her young cousin, I think she was like 16 when she got pregnant. She had a child and they ended up adopting this child as a little baby boy and they ended up naming him Marvin and raising him as their own. But despite all that, it didn't take long for the relationship to start kind of going downhill because it turns out that Marvin sort of took after his father a little bit in that he liked to have multiple affairs with multiple women. There was even like a rumor. I don't think it's ever been proven. Um, but there was a rumor that Marvin, the baby that they adopted was actually his baby that he had gotten her 16 year old niece pregnant. I don't know if there's any truth to that. I didn't see online that it was ever proven, but this is something that like people whispered. Marvin was said to be having affairs left and right. He would hook up with women he knew. He would hook up with groupies who were just into him because he was Marvin Gaye. And when he couldn't get any of those women, he would just um, hire sex workers. Like he was always having his affairs. And this wasn't good for their good for the marriage. And one of these affairs in particular is probably one of the main reasons that him and Anna ended up getting their divorce. And this is when he had an affair with a 17 year old girl named Janice Hunter. Now Janice was clearly underage. I'm not going to just gloss over that. She was 17 years old and she was the daughter of the girlfriend of a producer that Marvin was working with. So one day the girlfriend brought the daughter to like a recording session or whatever that Marvin was at. And as soon as he met the 17 year old girl, sparks flew. 
Marvin said when he met Janice, she seemed like more than a real girl. She seemed like a gift from God. And Janice said that she had been in love with Marvin Gaye since she was eight years old and had seen him on America's Bandstand, which is fucking weird. I'm going to say it. It's so weird. It reminds me very much of Natalie Wood and uh, Robert Wagner because she was like in love with him from when she was a kid too. And it just seems strange. But either way, they hit it off and the affair began. After that, he divorced his wife, Anna, in 1973 and married Janice four years later. And then the two went on to have two children together. This was Nona and Frankie. And Janice has said that the early years were like magic. But then as time marched on and Marvin's fame grew, so did his dependence on drugs, particularly cocaine. And his behavior just became much more erratic. Like as time came, went by, fame went by, affairs went by drugs. He became a lot to handle for her. (laughs) This case, Marvin Gaye's life and his death reminded me a lot of looking into John Lennon um, because I did a video on John Lennon. So I had to look into his life to do that video, which if you haven't seen it, I'll try to remember to link it. If not, you can search his name and my name and it'll come up. But the two cases reminded me of each other in that they were really disappointing to look into because both of these men are seen and remembered even now as like symbols of peace. They were symbols and faces of a movement against hate and racism and war. Like that is how they are seen and remembered, but they were also very troubled men and they didn't seem to be able to extend the same sort of kindness and peace to the people in their own lives. And it's just like they say, don't meet your heroes because like, it's really hard. And I don't really like looking into these like, these particular types of cases and these troubled men because you see darkness in them. And it's something that I can't just like gloss over and be like, yeah, they were great because there's going to be a shit ton of people and me even that are like, but they did some fucked up stuff. You know what I mean? So I just needed to say that before I move on to like some fucked up stuff he did. As Marvin Gaye's addiction became more and more intense, he became abusive in many ways. First verbally complaining about the changes to Janice's body after having his children. And he became physically abusive and sexually abusive. And I'm not going to get into all the details of the sexual abuse, but he was known to be a sexual deviant who would encourage or force his partners to do things that they may not be comfortable with. Like for example, forcing Janice to have a threesome with another couple while he watched and then berating her about it afterwards. And as far as the physical abuse goes, we know that it, on at least one occasion, he threatened to kill her. He like held a kitchen knife to her throat and told her that he loved her. He loved her too much and that his love for her was killing him and then begged her, begged her to provoke him so that he could put both of them out of their miseries. She said of this moment, quote, I was petrified, paralyzed, I thought it was all over. And that's fucking horrible. Okay, it's terrible. And he at this time was clearly spiraling and he was suicidal shortly after this, like right around this time, he tried to take his own life. He took a bunch of drugs and tried to overdose while in Hawaii. And it's just clear that he was going through a lot and it wasn't um, good. Like it wasn't, he wasn't expressing himself well and he wasn't doing nice things. And suffice it to say, the marriage didn't last long. They were only married a couple of years before Marvin and Janice too got a divorce. So that's what's going on in his personal life. But then in his professional life, he is like putting out bangers and making money like he's never seen before. He was inarguably one of Motown records best and brightest and helped establish their sound in the sixties before like other famous musicians at that time, the Beatles, for example, he moved more into singing about things that really mattered. He had something to say about social justice issues and he said them through his music going into the seventies. His iconic song, what's going on remains one of the most pivotal protest songs ever written. And he wrote this in protest of the Vietnam war and also a bunch of race riots that he saw happening around the country around the time that he wrote it. And I would argue, I would venture to argue that it's one of the best songs ever written. And I feel like you may disagree with that. And to anybody who does disagree with it, I would just like to quote the movie when Harry met Sally and say, everyone thinks they have good taste and a good sense of humor, but like not everybody can have good taste. Which, by the way, also, he was nominated for a Grammy for this song and actually didn't win, which surprised me. I don't understand, but okay. 
Now, if what's going on isn't quite doing it for you, I think it's safe to say that all of us have probably reenacted that scene from Stepmom and sang the song Ain't No Mountain High Enough into our hairbrushes with our loved ones. At least I would like to guess that we've all done that. I don't actually know your life, so maybe you haven't, but um, those are just two really good songs is my point. But despite putting out those bangers, as I said, he had a lot of issues. So when I was researching for this case, I came upon a quote about Marvin that really spoke to me. This quote said in part that Marvin Gaye was a man who chased away the demons of millions with his heavenly sound and divine art, but he himself was chased by demons of his own throughout his life. And one of those demons was his own father. With that, we're going to go back to Marvin Sr., a man who really seemed to hold himself to a very high standard. He held himself to high regard and he was very jealous of his son's success because he felt he was the one who had the right to be like, like a voice for people, you know? He really thought he had more important things to say. So to see his son, who he saw as living an ungodly life, be given center stage made him resentful. Marvin, over the course of his recording career, had become the voice his father wished to be. He was more successful, he made more money, and people were running to Marvin Jr. for help and not his father, and this really, really upset Marvin Sr. But despite all this, Marvin Jr. still really wanted to please his father to, quote, treat him honorably. So he would do all kinds of stuff for him. He would, like, get him tickets to go to his shows. He would spend money on him. He'd buy him cars. He bought that house so that his mother and his father could live in it together. Like, he made sure to take care of his mother and his father. Marvin Gaye was said to be a sensitive soul and didn't understand why his father didn't acknowledge him, witness him. He just wanted to be loved by him but he never was. And then instead, he was murdered by him. So here's what happened. Marvin Gay Jr. had been doing poorly for a while. He had slipped a lot deeper into drugs and depression. Now he had been married twice. He had been divorced twice. And since he had children with both of these women, he also had to pay them money for his children, who they are raising. And he wasn't doing well financially at this time, which always blows my mind when people get very, I was just talking about this yesterday, when people get very rich, have all this money and somehow lose it all. Because when I tell you I have been poor always and somehow never broke, you know what I mean? I've always made it work. I do not know how people get in these positions, but this is what was going on with him. In addition to that, he owed money to the man. Apparently he owed like $6 million to the government. And he like, as a rule, as a principle, was pretty anti-government and particularly anti-taxes. And this because he is because when he was growing up, he felt like he didn't get the help he needed. His family didn't get the help they needed from governmental assistance and things like that when he was younger. And he believed this was due in part to his family being black. So needing money, he went on tour for a while. He made some money. He like got into a better financial place and then he dipped. He left the country as a tax exile. And this ended up actually being good for him personally because while he was out of the country, away somewhere else, he ended up being able to get into a treatment center and he was able to kick the cone cocaine habit for a bit. And then while he was there, he started making music again. And then he ended up releasing this song. It's called Sexual Hearing. He'll sexual healing. It's pretty obscure. You probably haven't heard of it. Just kidding. It was a bop as the kids say, and this song actually ended up winning him his first Grammy. So he came back to the States and he did like a big tour and made a ton of money. But here's the thing. And returning to the U S and returning to the music scene and returning to the touring scene, he also started using cocaine again. And this time it got really bad. He got very paranoid. He started hiring extreme security and even started wearing bulletproof vests on stage because he was convinced he was going to die, that he was going to be poisoned or he was going to be shot dead. And now this brings us to his father. A few months prior to his murder, Marvin moved into the home in Los Angeles that he had bought for his mother and his father. He was, you know, struggling with drugs, struggling with depression, back in debt. And it really just shows how the mighty can fall because this was like not very long after his Grammy win. And all of a sudden he's in this position again. On top of his struggling, his mother, Alberta had actually just had surgery. So he was also moving in to help her because he knew his mother couldn't depend on her husband, Marvin Sr. to help her in this time of recovery. At this time, Marvin Sr. and Alberta were not good. They were not even really in a relationship anymore. They were living in the same house, but they weren't like 
together. They didn't have any kids to bind them to each other anymore. They weren't even sleeping in the same bed. They were just staying in the same house, which was a household that Marvin Gaye Jr. supported financially. So Marvin Jr. is back in this home and he is not doing well. He is really, really deep in the drugs. He's hiring sex workers all the time, things that he can't really afford. And he is just getting bad. He's getting paranoid. He's looking out the windows a lot. He's talking about how someone's out to get him or talking about taking his own life. And his mother is desperate. She's trying to convince him to get back into a program, but she's unsuccessful in getting him to help himself. And it got so bad that he had even tried to take his own life by jumping out of a moving car. So here he was with this sort of mental state, living in a home with his mother and father who are not getting along. And he is not getting along with his father either. Apparently it was so bad that when he moved in, when he first moved in, his sister was actually living in the home as well. But once Marvin moved in and he and his father started to butt heads, she actually moved out to get away from the hostility. Now, it wasn't just Marvin Sr. and Marvin Jr. who were fighting at this time. Apparently in the days leading up to the murder, Marvin Sr. and Alberta were really going at it too. And they were doing this in front of their son. And then it all came to a head on April 1st, 1984, one day shy of Marvin's 45th birthday when Marvin Sr. started yelling in Alberta over some like lost insurance policy letter. Around 12.30 p.m. that day, an irritated Marvin Sr. started yelling towards Alberta, asking her about this insurance letter. And at the time that it happened, Alberta was actually in Marvin Jr.'s room and the two were hanging out when they heard him yell. And Marvin Jr. got irritated at the fact that he was yelling at his mother. And he's like, listen, he yelled back, like, listen, if you have something to say to my mother, come and talk to her face. Stop yelling at her from like a distance. Apparently at this, Marvin Sr. like refused to come up and talk to Alberta face to face. So Marvin Jr. was like, you know, like, that's right. You better stay out of my room. And in response, Marvin Sr. was like, okay, then. And marched, uh, I believe, upstairs to Marvin's room, screaming at Alberta the whole time. In response to this, Marvin Jr., who had been like laying in his bed, he jumped up. He was pissed because of how his father was talking to his mother. And he got into his face and was like, you better not talk to my mother like that. And you need to get out of my room. And from there, a fight began. Marvin Sr. refused to leave. This pissed Marvin Jr. off. They had a lot of built-up resentment and the fight broke out. And Alberta said of this fight, quote, Marvin hit him. I shouted for him to stop, but he paid no attention to me. He gave my husband some hard kicks. This fight was long awaited and Marvin Jr. went off. He punched his father over and over in the face. The, the fight was hot, it was heavy, but it didn't last long because his father, Marvin Sr., escalated so quickly. So the two stopped fighting. Like they stopped fighting and Marvin Sr. actually left the room, leaving just Marvin Jr. and Alberta alone in the room. And then Alberta started trying to like calm down her son. He like sat down on the bed and she was trying to calm him down. And all of a sudden, Marvin Sr. reappeared in the doorway. And now he was holding a 38 caliber revolver. This gun actually belonged to Marvin Jr. He had brought it to the home when he moved back in, but when he was having like a really paranoid state and was, you know, like thinking of hurting himself, he gave his dad this gun to hold so that he wouldn't do that. And now his father walked up to him with that 38 caliber revolver and he shot him. He was sitting on the bed. His father shot him once and that shot was fatal because as I told you in the beginning, I went through a shit ton of organs. And then he like slid from the bed onto the floor and his father walked up to him and shot him a second time at point blank range. Alberta saw all of this, right? It was very intense for her. She said her husband just walked in and didn't say anything. He just lifted the gun and she screamed. And then he shot her son and then her son screamed. And then her husband just walked up and shot him again. And she said at this time, she just freaked out and she ran out of the room because she thought that she was going to be next. She thought that he was just going to kill them all. And what's really sad is that even though the first shot was fatal, it didn't kill him right away. He didn't die immediately. He actually lived long enough to get out some final words. So apparently his brother Frankie lived on the property. There was another house on the property and he had actually heard the gunshots and at first thought it was like a car, like a car backfiring. But then he heard the scream. So he ran over and when he got there, he saw his brother and he was like holding his brother in his lab when his brother said his last words. And he says that his brother's last words were, quote, I got what I wanted. I couldn't do it myself, so I made him do it. The police then arrived to find Marvin Sr. sitting on the porch, I guess just waiting for them to arrive. He was super calm, and when they went in the house, they found that the gun that was used in the murder was hidden under his pillow. 
Now, Marvin Sr. was arrested, and he pled not guilty to all of his charges, saying, like, his, his defense was going to be self-defense. His defense was going to be self-defense. Yes, cool. Basically, he said that he was afraid of his son, who was bigger than him, stronger than him, and also strung out on drugs. He said that he was worried he was going to be hurt or he was going to be killed. So that was his whole explanation for what happened. Now, he was held and he was given bail, but his wife, Alberta, posted his bail, so he was released. Now, Alberta said that her husband was chilling when she picked him up from the jail. She said of this quote, He started speaking to me, but said nothing about Marvin. His eyes were dry. He wasn't apologetic or repentant. He acted like somebody who had finally gotten something out of the way. But Marvin Sr. says that that's not true, essentially, that he regretted what he did immediately. He said that when he shot Marvin, he walked out of the room and he assumed that he was fine, which is still like crazy to me. But he says that he only knew something was wrong when Alberta came in and was like, oh my God, like our son is bleeding. And he says he went in, he saw that Marvin was in fact bleeding and told her like, call the police. He said of his feelings, quote, I fear God. I respect God. I'm sorry. And I regret what happened to this moment. Now, after being released from jail, Marvin Sr. actually went back to the house, the house where he had murdered his son, but Alberta didn't. She said that she could never see herself setting foot in that home again. She said that that place to her was essentially just a tomb. Right after he was released, Alberta also tried to get a divorce from her husband, but I'm not sure exactly what happened, but they didn't end up getting divorced. She just settled for them being separated, settled for them being separated. Yeah. But essentially she left, she moved out, she did her own thing and she completely like broke off from her husband. This really seemed to upset Marvin Sr., um, his wife leaving, and I guess his kids didn't really come to see him either. And he did do an interview at one point, and he said of this quote, If you see my wife, tell her I'm hurt, and I want to see her so bad. All of my children, I don't know if they've turned against me or what, but they were hurt. You know what I mean? I, I, I can't imagine being in that position, but they all just kind of had to deal with it in their own way. Alberta just straight up dipped, left him, and was no longer going to have a relationship. But that relationship sounded like it was pretty much over from the start, to be honest. Um, his son, Marvin Jr.'s brother, Frankie, left to London. He needed to get as far away from the situation as possible. And this left Marvin's sister, Ziola, to be like the one person there, the person who was the representative, the speaker for the family. And she said that like their family was irreparably damaged and said that her mother never got over this. And even his grandkids, at least his granddaughter was totally done with him. She was only 10 years old and she decided that she was going to start calling him Mr. Gay. It wasn't that she hated him. She didn't have hate for him, but she didn't want a relationship with him and she didn't want to show him any love anymore. A memorial service was held for Marvin Gaye in the Hollywood Hills and there were so many people in attendance. Uh, Smokey Robinson, you know, Brian Howard's favorite musician, along with Stevie Wonder, both um, gave eulogies at the service. And Stevie Wonder, who said Marvin really encouraged him to make the music within him, also wrote a song for the occasion called Lighting Up the Candles. It's just all very sad, but let's move to the legal part of this. So Marvin Sr., he says, you know, yes, I shot him, but it was in self-defense. I was trying to protect myself. I wanted to stop him from beating me, which was weird considering like the fight had stopped, right? Marvin had stopped beating him. He had left the room, then went, got a gun, returned and shot him. He says that his son was very violent, very aggressive, that his son threw him to the floor and kicked him all over his body. He said he kicked him anywhere he could kick. But some cops that were there, uh, like, contradicted this, saying that there was no evidence that an, a beating that brutal had taken place. And they said specifically, quote, there was no indication of bruises on his head, nothing like he'd been punched out or that kind of stuff. But that's what he said. That's what he said happened. He said that when he got the gun and he shot his son, he didn't realize that he had hurt him as bad as he had because he believed that this gun was loaded with BBs or with blanks. He says when he shot his son, the first bullet didn't seem to phase him at all. He says that his son just looked at him like perhaps he had been shot with a BB. So he shot again. He says he was backing out of the room when he fired the second shot and that his plan was to just leave the room and go lock himself in his own room. Now, this is wild, and I honestly, when I look at this, I cannot understand why this happened, but Marvin Sr. was given a plea deal. He ended up pleading no contest to voluntary manslaughter, and at 70 years old, he was given a six-year suspended sentence and just five years probation. Apparently, there were a couple of factors that made them come to this decision. The first was that Marvin Sr. was in failing health. I guess before the trial started, he actually had surgery because they discovered that there was a brain tumor on his brain. Brain tumor, you get it. And so he was in terrible health. And on top of that, they considered that 
Marvin Jr. was the aggressor. I guess the defense and the prosecution, like both agreed that because of his age and his ailing, ailing health, failing health, both are kind of the same. Uh, because of his age and how sick he was, he did not present a threat to the society. To the society. This is a good sentence. Basically, they're like, he's old as hell. He's sick as hell. He's not going to hurt anyone else. And plus, Marvin kind of started it. This is the vibe that I got. Marvin Sr. tearfully apologized to the court, saying, quote, If I could bring him back, I would. I was afraid of him. I thought I was going to get hurt. I don't know what was going to happen. I'm really sorry for everything that happened. I loved him. I wish he could step through this door right now. I'm paying the price now. Paying the price. Well, you get to go home free on a suspended sentence and your son is dead in the ground. Okay. Now Marvin Sr. did not take advantage of his freedom. He apparently like really fell hard into the bottle after he was released with Alberta saying that he was drinking like a fifth of vodka a day, which is just like that's a lot of vodka. And then he ended up dying alone in a nursing home on October 10th, 1998. And this was just a little more than a week after his 84th birthday. Marvin Gaye's death affected so many people. He was so beloved that he was even inducted into the Rock and Roll Hall of Fame in 1987. And his memory has inspired so many musical tributes over the years, with many people mentioning him in his songs. People who respected him and remembered him and wanted him to be remembered through their music. But of course, the people that were most affected by his murder were his family. Janice, his ex-wife, says that she will never forget him and that she remembers him with love whenever she looks into her kids' faces. She says that through them, she's able to see Marvin every day. And it was his kids, the people who loved him most, those who really carried on his legacy, that were the ones to spread his ashes over the Pacific Ocean once he was cremated. And with that, that, my friends, is the story of the murder of the Prince of Soul, Marvin Kaye. I hope you found this video to be informative and it made sense. And of course, I just want to thank you for remembering Marvin with me today. Now, considering everything I told you throughout this video, I want to revisit the question of the day. And that was this. Do you believe that Marvin Gaye instigated the fight with his father in a sort of assisted suicide situation? There are a lot of people out there who believe that Marvin Gaye wanted to die that day and that he wanted his father specifically to be the person who killed him so that his father would be burdened with the guilt for the rest of his life. So that's a lot. And I'm very curious what you think. Let me know all your thoughts in the comments below. Before you leave, please don't forget to leave me a case suggestion down below. As you know, I have a long list of cases and whenever you leave a suggestion, I put your name next to it. So if I cover it, I can give you a shout out. I love looking into the cases you guys suggest because they're often cases that I haven't heard of or cases that need more coverage. And I know you're filled with good ideas and good taste. Otherwise, you would not be here. If you haven't already, please don't forget to join the Brat Pack by subscribing and ringing that bell. I put out a new video every single week and I would love to hang out with you. Yes, you specifically you, but I can only do that if you join the Brat Pack and become one of us. And if you want to hang out more consistently, all my social media is listed down below along with a link to my membership where you can get early access to non-sponsored videos, priority comment responses, things like that. Now I just want to say one last thank you to Huge Casino for partnering with me on today's video. It's partners like Huge Casino that make it possible for me to put out videos as consistently as I do. And a big thank you to you guys for always being so supportive of all of my sponsors. You rock, don't ever change. And with all of that said, I just want to thank you for being here when you could literally be anywhere else in the world. That is tight. You are tight. Please stay safe and be a better person than you were yesterday. And I hope to see you in my next video, which will be on Monday. Bye.